What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What If I Was Reborn as White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice. Part 1. Smoker is one of those characters in One Piece who is often disrespected, although the MC, as he trains to change the future of the canon Smoker and revolutionize the Marines, under the tutelage of the hero of the Marines, Monkey D. Garp. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Hey, Pirate King, where did you hide all the treasure you found? Woke dream, while we are asleep, we live within the imaginary world created based on our memories and experiences. It is once we've woken up that we perceive it as a dream. Is it in the Grand Line? You got it, didn't you? That legendary treasure One Piece, however. What if you don't wake up? What if your dream is the reality? And what you believe to be real all this time was a dream instead? Wahaha ha my treasure. E don't speak without the permission I found myself standing in the middle of the crowd. Dumbfounded is one man with long black hair to cover his facial appearance. Grinned in front of the executioner's blades. Gold D. Roger, the king of the pirates. Yes, I did recognize him. He he was the legendary figure within the manga named One Piece. One of the most phenomenal stories that has ever been unveiled in the reality. If you want it, you can have it. Hold on, reality. Find it. I left everything this world has to offer there then came. An abrupt execution by the scared executioners. The king of pirates met his end in the Logue town, in front of my eyes. The crowd uproared in excitement. Without a doubt, Goldie Rogers' will has been passed on to the next generation already. Marking the beginning to the great age of the pirates I thought, as I slapped myself on the cheek. It stung, and yet, I didn't wake up. Was it that I transmigrated? Or was it that I belong within this world from the start and somehow, just somehow, dreamed of what may happen in the future here? And hold on, who am I? As people around were rushing in and out of excitement, I stood here frozen facing an identity crisis. Then, due I was knocked down all of a sudden by one huge man, who didn't seem to have seen me standing. Ah, once again, another jolt of pain. Without a doubt, I wasn't dreaming. Oh, I am sorry. The man leaned down and lifted me back up with his huge hand. Hold on, don't we know each other? Your name was, hold on and how come I can understand what they are saying? I couldn't follow. Just what was happening around me? What is reality? Who am I? This can't be a dream, right? I, what am I supposed to do? Smoker, that's right, Smoker. That was your name, wasn't it? I found my eyes widening upon hearing the name Smoker. I raised my hands up and touched my hair, feeling the spiky rough texture. Sir, is my hair white? Hum. The man raised an eyebrow, but nodded nonetheless. Yes, you indeed are. The man who is called White Hunter by many, known to have eaten smoke smoke fruit. A renowned marine with the rank of a captain or vice admiral in the manga. One who has, unfortunately, lost most of his battles. Smoker. That is me it seemed. Logue Town. The island located in the East Blue, and is known to be close to the Red Line. Smoker was born in Grand Line. Yet. Here he is right now, in the East Blue at the age of 12. How come? A rash boy he truly was, gaining a small boat for himself and impulsively sailing out, only to be consumed by the wild sea a day later. It was a miracle that he survived or was he that he was inherently tough, blessed with a strong body, and will. By the time he woke up, no. He didn't wake up I thought, he died from drowning, and my supposed soul replaced his, if I were to follow the explanations regarding transmigration, which was given in many fanfictions that I've gone through. But here I was, when I woke up, I began vomiting out a huge volume of seawater, rendering me to believe that I was dreaming. Walking, and somehow, surviving throughout a few days without any food or water, made my belief that I was dreaming even further. But now, this was the reality. I realized this truth after having my first meal in this place once, given by one huge man who previously knocked me out during Goldie Rogers' execution. And what am I supposed to do now? I pondered with depression, still unable to believe that I have transmigrated. Boy, the man who sat on a table adjacent to me, with a mountain of food covering his face from me, said while munching, What's your plan from now on? With due respect, sir, I sighed and answered truthfully. I've got no idea what to do. Forget plan how am I supposed to survive another day like this? Upon hearing me, the man raised his head up and peeked at me from behind the food mountain. His eyes, uh, they seemed to be gleaming dangerously. Why don't you come with me then? The man said as he threw a donut into his mouth. I know a place that gives you a place to sleep, eat, and survive, as well as make you strong. That's... Hella suspicious I thought as I looked at the man with squinted eyes. But you know what? I wasn't in a position to think that far. Death, no matter what situation I lied within, was a scary thing to consider. Additionally, I've now come to think that perhaps transmigration wasn't necessarily a bad thing. 
I was living in what was considered as dreams of many Otakus. I wanted to give my shot here. What kind of oasis is that even? I exclaimed while chewing on a piece of bread. The man then made a smile. Marine, are the cannon route. But alas, joining the Marine seemed to be the best possible option for me, at the current moment. Are you a Marine as well sir? You got that right. The huge man puffed his chest up, I am the marine captain, dispatched all the way from the marineford in order to monitor any suspicious activity during Gold Roger's execution. We continued chatting, and the food on the table eventually disappeared into our stomachs. Satisfied, and feeling joy for the first time in this world, I slapped my fat stomach and grinned, thanks for the meal, captain. Huh, what do you mean? The marine captain then made a frown. I thought you were paying. He then took in a deep breath before shouting. Smoker, I froze as I looked at the man with disbelief causing the man to burst out in laughter. Bahaha. I was joking, kiddo. Placing the bill down on the table, the marine captain motioned at me, come on, I'll get you enlisted. And from now on, call me Captain Merlin, you got that? Ah, I nodded slowly, sure. One, one, two, two, one, one. Upon the instructor's call, all the marine trainees bent their arms in the push-up position, two, two, before raising them back up after the word two being spoken out of instructor. The trainees were expressing pain and exhaustion. Their frail arms shook, threatening to collapse at any moment. Their sweat poured over the training ground like rain, and their attires were drenched beyond belief. And yet, in the middle of this sweaty training session, I found my state drastically better than the other trainees. Although my arms were just as thin as them, and my body, which puberty hasn't hit yet, was smaller than the most. Halt! You may rest. And after who knows how long passed, the instructor finally called upon checking the time through his watch. With groans here and there, all trainees simultaneously fell on the ground, huffing and wheezing intensely. I too was one of them, but with enough strength to quickly raise my body back up. Smoker was smoker indeed. He, from the start, was different than those of the cannon fodders. Who letting out a light breath? I gazed at the view of the lively log town as if the execution of Goldie. Roger was forgotten. Two months already passed by since my transmigration. But here I am, still unable to believe that I am in the world of One Piece. After Captain Merlin had me enlisted, I was placed with these fellow peers in this training school. Among us, the talented trainees will be sent to the headquarter, Marineford, and be groomed as an officer. Marine, in terms of system, followed the ideal of meritocracy, although not completely I thought as I shifted my gaze to the side, where a huge and burly trainee, who didn't seem to be as exhausted as the others, similar to me, those whose parents are Marines themselves, have a head start. And additionally, the fellows whose parents are quite well known. I turned my gaze to the frail-looking trainee, whose arms were crossed, and his face was in a visible frown during the whole training session, having refused to conduct the training, causing nothing but a trouble, yet due to the statuses of that guy's parents. The instructors are unable to make fault out of his troubling actions, as to why the parents of so-called high statuses will send their children here. I presume that it was to knock the arrogance out of their children, although it didn't seem to be working. However, above all, the problem lies in the fact that their eyes... Whether the ones who had a head start, or the ones from a noteworthy background, they currently were looking at me with envy and amazement. The fact that the frail boy of no known background was running as the number one trainee of this school was obviously getting on their nerves. Teens tend to be immature. Acting out of impulses, the lack of rationality leads to an action based on one's instinct and selfishness. I should be prepared for whatever may be coming in the future. With a grimace, I leaned down and grabbed a towel that lie beneath me, before hanging it around my shoulder and walking away leaving the other trainees by themselves. During the evening, the meal is served. Afterward, an hour of free time is given, although limited within this marine training facility. But in this free hour, there isn't much to do. Considering that after this free time comes the eight hour long sleep, thanks to the voice of the Vice Admiral Monkey D. Garp, the trainees usually go to sleep early for an extra bit of rest. In other words, this is the time when I can enjoy solitude. During this hour, I usually go up to the top floor of the building, and view the starry night which was considered rare in my previous world. And the stars here are different, I muttered to myself while stargazing, Big Dipper, Sirius, and other constellations. I cannot find them no matter how many times I observe. Do you find me strange that I've adjusted to this life too well? Do you consider me numb, with there being no sense of loneliness and depression within me, but optimism instead? Truthfully, I don't have an answer for this. Perhaps whoever transmigrated me did something within me, so that I won't face implications regarding those types of concerns. Creak then, the doorway that leads to the inside of the building opened, jolting me awake from my moment of stargazing. As I expected from within, three burly teens revealed themselves, walking at me with dark expressions on their faces. You are here again, smoker. Without turning around, I spoke you guys again. Well, the one in the middle asked, have you made your answer? I groaned in annoyance, fascinating as I did so. There are way too many whole mepos here, for Nick's sake. Turning around, I faced three teens who were looking at me with an annoyance of their own, while pocketing their hands within their pockets. If not, I will say it once again, for the final time. 
The one in the middle held his huge hand out at me, join Lloyd's line. He promised us the title of a marine officer, along with a place on his ship in the future. Considering the fact that his father is none other than a Commodore, this is worth the deal. This dude's name is Bratty. He, along with his two friends, are whom I call brain dead jockeys. They showcase excellent performances during physical training, while screwing up every other things. I've already noted that they would serve as the great cannon fodders. ECH come on, Braddy said impatiently, leaning down at me. He said that this is the last time. Don't make him angry. Look, I said with a deadpan. Do you think being a marine is a joke? Is it children's play to you guys? Hey, the guy on Braddy's left, Sally, huffed and puffed angrily at me. What did you just say? Akin to an ox, his nostrils expanded and retracted. Oh, I just cited a booger. Oops, too much information. I raised my hands up in a confusion. What did I say to anger you? Then, I, by reflex, took a step back to dodge an impulsive punch from the guy on Bratty's right Donny. Really? I ducked just in time for Bratty and Sally to punch each other's fists, causing them to cry in pain. Lloyd told us to, oh, Bratty spoke while holding his bruised knuckle. Kill you if you don't accept his offer this time around. Kill. I was flabbergasted. What is he? A pirate. Bending my torso to the left, I dodged Donnie's right fist, which ended up slamming onto the door that was right behind me. Ah, my hand Donnie screamed while rolling on the ground, with his right hand now swollen to a comical degree. E Donnie Bratty shouted with widened eyes, before directing his anger at me, Smoker. Lowering his body so that his head was pointed at me, Braddy charged at me like a bull. Raya, however, right before his head collided on my chest, I sidestepped casually, causing Braddy's head to slam onto Sally, who was standing back up wobbly. Thud, knocking Sally unconscious. Sally Braddy cried while falling to his knees in a panic. Standing next to the door, I sweat dropped. Yeah, I'm out of here. Grabbing the doorknob. I twisted it and opened the door, only to see a pink head girl standing behind it with widened eyes. Of course, she was none other than Hina, known as Smoker's colleague in the canon. A pretty fellow she was, and along with the fact that there were barely any females in this training facility, Hina was being dashed here and there by the smelly boys, only for her to reject their confessions with cold words. Currently, she was standing in front of me, with her widened eyes headed at the scene behind me, at three jockeys. Ah, uh, hi. I said awkwardly before turning around to see three jockeys, don't mind them. They just had a fight among themselves as if Hina is going to believe that, Hina said coldly, causing me to sigh, for I expected her to react like this. I know that it looks as if I am in the wrong right when you just came, but it isn't. I owe my hand. I was interrupted by Bratty's sudden cry, causing Hina's eyes on me to become colder. Hina is reporting this to the instructors. Hina looked at me with a frown, these unnecessary beatdowns that you've given to those three go against Marine's ideal of justice. I'm telling you, I didn't punch them even once. I raised my hands up to express my innocence, but much to my chagrin, it was to no avail. And on the next day, I was labeled as the problem kid, with the news having been spread across the entirety of the trainees. Trainee smoker, upon the start of the training session, I was called out by an instructor as a punishment, you will be doing double the exercise of the rest of the trainees for six months. Fuck I thought to myself, and shifted my eyes to where Hina was standing still. Ah, uh, where are you looking at, trainee smoker? Fuck oh shit, I've said the wrong word. I meant I I froze during my statement, before rubbing the back of my head, e, trainee smoker, the three jokies, along with the skinny dude with long blonde hair. Lloyd, were laughing their asses off from the back. Easy. Way too easy I thought as I sprinted around the training ground, non-stop, at thrice the speed of any other who were running. It was truly a strange experience to have. Physical improvement is not something that comes this quickly into this extent. Although I've been conducting thrice the amount of the usual physical exercises as punishment for a whole month, they no longer were capable of bringing me down to exhaustion. Just what the hell is with this body? I thought to myself, but with joy. Improving substantially every day was truly a fun experience to have. And does this mean that if I were to increase the load of exercise even more, I will improve just as much. Becoming strong for the past three months was none of my concern. I simply focused on getting every day through, especially after having my daily exercises thrice due to being wrongly accused. But now, the thought of becoming strong brought me to an excitement. I mean, who wouldn't like to get strong? The four emperors, the seven warlords, although such systems have not been established yet. I know better than anyone else of how dangerous this world is. And in order to become even stronger I therefore thought, I need to be punished more. Narrowing my eyes as I continued to run, I looked at the back of the wimpy blonde, Lloyd, who was walking in the front with his hands in his pockets. Expressing boredom, he occasionally laughed at the trainees who ended up fainting in the mid-track. Smoker. However, before I could begin, a feminine voice called me out from the back. I groaned in annoyance, fuck off, Hina. You are thinking of doing something bad again, aren't you? Hina, while breathing heavily due to the ongoing run, shouted from my back, Hina knows. And Smoker fucking doesn't care. Without turning back, I increased lowered my posture, and quickened the movement of my legs, ultimately increasing my speed beyond the point I thought it was possible. Get over here. Ignoring Hina's cry, 
I stuck my left hand out as I ran, which then slammed onto Lloyd's back. HHHH Lloyd's eyes popped out, and his jaw dropped wide open in shock as his head was smacked all of a sudden. His tongue stretched out to an extent where I wondered if it was made out of rubber. I quickly retracted my arm back, and continued to run as if nothing happened. But obviously, everyone witnessed what just happened. Smoker standing back up with a huge lump at the back of his head, Lloyd screamed. With his arms clenched, he began to run in order to return me the favor. But within five seconds of running, he tripped himself and fell on the ground face first. Trainee Smoker, unable to bear the scene any longer, the instructor called me out. Out. Success I thought. Within the load town, there lied the marine base next to its training facility, where Smoker currently dwelled. The commander of this base, starting three months ago, was none other than Captain Merlin, who initially believed that Goldie. Roger's death would lead this weakest sea to become even easier to manage. However, Roger's final words instead served as the trigger for many to resort to piracy, to search for this mysterious treasure named One Piece. Just this month alone, too many civilians in the Logue town have suffered at the hands of the invading pirates. Merlin massaged his temple to ease his headache, but to no avail. How can one man have such an impact? Is the idea of One Piece really that tempting? Sighing, Merlin slouched in his chair, tired of the endless work. Then, the door into this room was knocked from the outside, earning Merlin's attention. Enter. After Merlin's approval, the door slowly opened revealing the marine instructor who seemed quite troubled by his expression. Captain Merlin, the instructor stood strictly and saluted before lowering his arm, and waiting for an approval to speak. Motioning Hen to tell the instructor to relax, Merlin asked, What is it? The instructor sighed and talked, I am here to nominate two students as the candidates to be sent to the headquarter. This soon, Merlin, said with a genuine surprise, and who may they be? Trainee Smoker and Hina, Captain. The instructor seemed to be troubled, one is causing too much troubles, and the other repress her peers far too much, asking for nothing but perfection out of them. They are disrupting the environment here, Smoker. Merlin muttered with a disbelief, are you referring to yes? The boy whom you enlisted Captain. Hina, I am able to understand. She was considered one of the top seeds of this generation from the start, with her having her root in the Grand Line. However, Smoker what about him is so troubling. Be more specific. The instructor revealed a couple of files from his hands, passing them to Merlin. Merlin looked at them carefully, and frowned in a further confusion. Three boys with outstanding physical prowess among the marine trainees. Lost. The given punishments have no effect, and the trainee simply adapted too fast. An incredible potential is seen, but his attitudes cannot be corrected with the current instructor's capabilities. There was no need to look further, Merlin thought. Placing the papers down, he immediately stated, I will write the referral letter to the instructor Zephyr. It was early in the morning, and the sun still hasn't risen yet. I was sleeping soundly with a sleep mask on my eyes, before getting suddenly yanked out of my hard trainee bed. An enemy. I quickly alerted myself and sent a punch out at whoever lifted me up by the back of my shirt, which was effortlessly blocked by a huge hand. Ha! Huh. Still half awake, I exclaimed upon sighting the silhouette of a huge man in front of me. You really are aggressive, the huge man sighed. Do you know what title you go by these days? The apostrophe 47th chaos is of Logue Town, shaking my head to wake myself up. I noticed that this man was none other than Captain Merlin. I squinted my eyes, before looking around my surrounding. I currently was getting carried out of the dorm, while all the other trainees were still asleep. Yeah yeah, it's your favorite adult, Merlin said with a tired expression as we exited the room, slowly closing the door. What's going on? I pointed my finger at the back of my shirt where Merlin gripped on, am I getting kicked out? Currently, with my mind frozen, that was all that I could think. After a short while, having reached the conclusion that I was getting kicked out of the marine due to the inflated rumors around me, I began to thrash hard in Merlin's grip, but to no avail. Fuck do you want me to become a pirate? Huh? I'm going to murder every piece of shit on this planet if I get kicked out, you hear? I screamed relentlessly. Smoker I mean me. My grandfather died three months ago. And I'm left with no relative. My hometown, from what I've seen from the newspaper, was wreaked havoc by the wave of pirates who have begun to sweep all from the Four Blues into the Grand Line. Simply put, I had no place to go back. Throw me out, and I will curse you for eternity. Even after my death, I will latch onto you as an evil spirit. I'll quote shut up for one second, you mad lad. Merlin's teeth turned sharp as he barked at me comically. Why yes sir. Which was effective in shutting my mouth down. Smoker. Just then. I noticed that we were now at the harbor, in front of one moderate-sized marine ship. And before the ship stood Hina and one male marine officer, who were looking at me with a sweat drop. Letting a deep breath in, Merlin placed me down, stood upright in a strict fashion, and saluted at the marine officer, Commodore Bartha. Relax, relax. This marine officer, named Bartha, was notably smaller than Merlin in terms of size. Blonde hair and blue-colored eyes, he was the typical handsome man that many would find themselves attracted excluding me, of course. So he's that smoker I've been hearing about in this town, eh? Bartha chuckled, before ruffling my hair casually. I gotta say, you would have made a great comedian as well. And just by that statement, I've come to dislike him. Just. 
Merlin sighed as he looked at me, listen to your superior's orders, you got that, Captain? I couldn't help but speak in confusion, raising my arms up questioningly, with due respect, what part of my attitude did you find rebellious in particular? I was always an obedient student, wasn't I? You are kidding me, right? Hina muttered from the side, which I ignored, without stopping. I then asked, besides, where are we going anyway? The headquarter of Marine, located in the Grand Line, which is known as the harshest sea of the world, Barthor answered the question with his hands on his back and a smile. Marineford. Marineford the top seat selection for the entry into the Marine Officer Grooming Program. I tilted my head while crossing my arms, but only three months passed by, didn't it? Normally, there will be a grand award ceremony at the end of the year for this. But, Merlin massaged his temple with a tired expression, you two are too much for us to take care of. I raised my eyebrow, is that a praise or an insult Ow. My words were then stopped by Hina, who walked up to me and slapped the back of my head. Respect your superiors, smoker. Seriously, tone down your rebellious tendency for once. Oh yeah, not everyone is an emotionless robot like you, Miss Third POV. Lower your voice. Stand straight and wait for an order from Commodore Bartha. We will be in charge of us from now on, until our arrival to Marineford. Ha <laughs> ha, what a hypocrite. You tell me to lower my voice, yet your voice is so freaking high that I can hear Haruno Sakura in my ears. Haruno Sakura, Bartha, who was watching the sudden feud between Hina and me with amusement, whispered at Merlin. Who's that? Not sure. Merlin looked at Bartha dryly, causing him to cough in embarrassment, before motioning at the marine soldiers who were on the deck. Well, um, I suppose that we will get going now. Bartha then jumped up at least 15 feet in my eyes, before landing on the deck of the tall ship. Noticing that the ship was now about to leave at any second, Hina and I stopped a verbal battle. Captain Merlin, regardless of how fast things were progressing, in the end, there was no doubt that Merlin has given me lots of help. I had nothing but gratitude for him, and therefore, expressed my thanks while waving my arms. Thank you for all that you've done for me. Hina, on the other hand, saluted him in a strict manner, trainee Hina of the Logue Town Marine Training Facility. Heading out, Merlin, whose expression softened, waved back at us. Good luck, kids. Using the metal ladder that was attached to the side of the ship, Hina and I got aboard it. Without further ado, along with the loud sound of horn, the ship began to sail out, away from the Logue Town that I dwelled for three months after my transmigration. Although it was sudden, my story has finally finished its prologue. I was afraid of the unknown, yet excited about what I may be able to achieve in the future. Hey, kids, until Bartha spoke to us with a gentle smile. While throwing two uniforms at us, it changed to that uniform. Sir, if you would not mind telling. I asked while opening the neatly folded uniform, what may this be for? It's an official way of telling that you've entered the rank of Marine. And what rank are we currently on? Hina asked. Sure boys, that's a rank. Hina and I thought at the same time. What was I expecting anyway? I couldn't help but think dryly as I mopped the floor with the sweats all over my body. I mean, chore boys do chores, and nothing more. Looking at the front, Hina too was mopping the deck just like me. The only difference was that unlike me, she was giving her all just for this. But, Bartha's explanations did make sense to me. We weren't here to be doted upon, but to be groomed as the capable warriors. That doesn't mean I like it though, especially when the one responsible for saying that is enjoying a glass of cocktail with sunglasses on his face, while lying on a comfy looking lounge chair. Hum. Bartha, who seemed to have noticed my gaze, turned at me before giving one mocking snort, eh? I was gripping my mop real tight at this point, struggling as hard as possible not to slap the man's head with this dirty mop of mine. Get your mind together, smoker. Hina, who was huffing as she mopped, then said to me, we still got a lot to cover, and Hina can't do this alone. TCH, clicking my tongue as Bartha turned back and began to chat with a woman in a bikini, someone whom I've got no idea where she came from. I turned back to reduce Hina's burden as much as possible. Hey, did you hear? Late at night, while eating a small portion of food hurriedly in the dining room of the ship, Hina and I poked up our ears upon hearing one marine soldier, who was whispering to his colleague adjacent to him. That Commodore Bartha I heard that he used to be a male prostitute in the past. Wah! The second one shouted in a shock, but his mouth was instantly covered by the first one who spoke the information. After calming down, he whispered back, and he climbed up all the way here from bottom to top. He's amazing indeed, no, that's not it. The first guy shook his head negatively, rumor says that one of his regular customers was a marine officer. He or she? I think it was he that's not what matters, alright? Hina and I looked at each other with our cheeks buffed up from the food, before focusing back on the conversation. One day, he somehow managed to make that marine officer customer of his to enlist him as the underling, and built his career. And along with the devil fruit that he got at one point, he managed to come where he is now. He skipped the entirety of the time it takes for a marine to become an officer, and became what he is now. Han. Are you sure about that? The second marine retorted, it's always the Commodore Bartha who gets us across the reverse mountain with the devil fruit power of his O. The first guy nodded, exactly, the devil fruit. Without the devil fruit, how strong is he even? I mean, 
Did you ever see him engaging on a hand-to-hand -hand combat without any use of devil fruit power? True true, now that you talk about it hey, you too. Then, the conversation between two marine soldiers were interrupted by another marine who seemed to have an authority over them. Quit mumbling among yourselves, and finish quick. Hina and I jumped up upon the sudden shout, but sighed in relief upon realizing that we weren't the targets of such words. We are about to enter the reverse mountain now there is no time to waste. The two marines immediately stood up and saluted. Sir, yes sir, with our eyes widened by the sudden news, Hina and I rushed our meals, but seriously, why are there melons in every single meal? Along with such meaningless thoughts. Commodore Bartha, chore boy smoker and chore boy Hina reporting in. After the dinner, Hina and I stood in front of Bartha, whose eyes were headed at the huge red mountain that had the extreme water current flowing against the gravity. Ah, you two are here, I see. Relax, relax, Bartha, who made a flashy grin on top of his good-looking face, said while putting on his justice coat. It's your first time coming across the full magnificence of the reverse mountain, I assume. I nodded with a gulp comma, yes, indeed. Although I saw the appearance of the reverse mountain in the Anaim, watching as its entirety was lied right in front of me, brought me nothing but an amazement. Not really. Hina, on the other hand, said stoically, I've been on my grandfather's ship couple of times before. Bartha's grin briefly faltered upon Hina's honest statement. But immediately masking his growing dislike for her, he stated while puffing his chest up and looking at me, Anyway, we're about to cross this mountain now, don't be surprised of what's going to happen a moment later. E, but Commodore, one nearby marine officer voiced his opinion worriedly, It's quite harsh out here. Shouldn't we have the kids inside the ship? No no, let them watch. Bartha dismissed the suggestion with a snort, when I was at their age. I was already free diving from 5.000 feet above, just for fun. Kids nowadays are too timid, and that needs to change. The loud noises of the waves crashing on the rocky mountain entered my ears. The wild wind, so harsh that I had to clench tightly on the rail, blew all around causing the ship to sway unstably. There sprang forth a nervousness in me, but I steeled my mind. The nature of the One Piece surely was harsh, and it was something that I never could have imagined happening back in the earth. But, at the same time, what is this growing sense of excitement? I thought as I gulped again, sail forth. Just as the ship began to shoot up by entering the rapid current of the reverse mountain, the wind was so strong that I had to close my mouth. I could barely open my eyes when facing forward, so I turned my head sideways. However, our sail here wasn't smooth. The ship was slowly tilting to the left, and I knew that at this rate, its side was going to crash on the rocks. And now, then Bartha stepped up haughtily, it's time for me to shine. He extended his right hand to which one marine soldier hurriedly placed a thick rope on top of. The other end of the rope was connected to the pole of the ship. Then, Bartha leaned down, and, his legs coiled up akin to spring, bringing me to a shock. The spring spring fruit, which is owned by Bellamy in the cannon. Boing. I watched as Bartha jumped and placed himself between the rocky mountain and the wall of the ship, HNNNNGGGGGGGG, before pushing the ship away from the hard rocks. His face was red, he was huffing hard, and his body was being dangled by the rope that was tied around his wrist, but he did manage it. But right now, this man owns that fruit. And although I don't remember the exact age of Bellamy, one inquiry entered my thought, does that mean that this man will die soon? I hope it was nothing but my paranoia. However, what if, just what if this man, Bartha, were to die during this sail? Bartha's death may mean much more than his death only. What if the marines on this ship were to face a sudden adversity, and get wiped out? What would happen to us then? Hey, a hand was placed on my shoulder, jolting me awake. Turning, I saw Hina, who held a look of concern. Are you alright? Before I could answer, Bartha landed in front of us and pointed a thumb as himself haughtily. Wasn't I ha amazing ha just ha now? Hina and I looked at the man without any expression, before answering at the same time, sure. All while this was going on, the ship was now rapidly descending on the other side of the reverse mountain into the Grand Line. Within the dark, stormy weather where the sea wildly thrashed, one marine ship sailed adamantly, all thanks to many marine soldiers who hurriedly moved around busily. However, this scene wasn't accessible to Hina and me, who were currently mopping the hallway located below the deck. Currently, the there were only two of us here, with no one to eavesdrop. Using this as an opportunity, I opened my mouth and asked to Hina, Hina, did you notice it? Hina, whose back was facing me, stopped mopping and turned around to face me. With her eyebrow raised, she said, notice what? Hina confused. Bartha, I said with a certainty in my voice, blonde hair, annoying personality, non-existent leadership, unquestionable strength. Who does he remind you of? Blonde annoying weak leader Hina mumbled while going into a thought, before her eyes widened in a realization, don't tell me raising her face up to look at me, Hina said with a disbelief, Bartha was the father whom Lloyd was bragging about. Most likely, I nodded with a pale face. After all, Lloyd did say that his father is a Commodore. And this means that if he finds out all those things I've done to Lloyd, the chance is, I'm fucked. Hina pursed her lips. Hina will keep it secret, but there is no guarantee that Bartha won't find out. Ha I sighed, I can only hope that we will get to the marine food before that happens. With the conversation having ended, we went back to our chores. 
It seemed as if this was going to continue until the evening, until, land, ho, we heard the cry of a marine lookout from the above causing us to perk up in excitement. Come on, let's go check it out. I said giddily, to which Hina responded with a shake of her head. No, Hina didn't finish the chore yet, wait, to hell with them. Grabbing Hina by an arm, I dragged her up to the deck. When I opened the door and enjoyed the bask of sunlight that greeted us, Commodore Bartha, we saw the numerous marines saluting at Bartho, who was standing at the edge of the deck, sneaking on the nearby marine, who was standing still as the greetings went on, I asked in a whisper, Sir, where are we right now? The marine smiled as he answered, We're currently on the marine base G4. Although the starting point of the Grand Line splits into seven different parts, we used the Eternal Post to bypass those islands that are booming with pirates, and came here right away. Oh, I see. Thank you for the answer. I thank the Marine, having got the answer that I wanted. Hey, why don't you wait just a little longer though? Then, the Marine pointed at the base ahead of us. It was reported that this base also harbors a troublesome boy like the two of you. Hina immediately stepped up with a huff troublesome. Hina believes you meant extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say. The Marine rolled his eyes, before placing his hand below his chin, and also, I heard that he's 14 years old. Huh! I exclaimed, so he's two years older than me. Hina is four years younger than him. I froze upon hearing Hina's words. Hang on, I turned and asked Hina with squinted eyes, you're ten. Hina crossed her arms, you got a problem with that. Forming a smile on my face, I raised my hand up and ruffled Hina's head. Nope, not at all. Get your hand off of Hina. With a frown, Hina immediately slapped my hand away, causing the marina me to chuckle. Hina glared at me. What are you laughing about, hello Dara? Before we were suddenly interrupted by one huge boy suddenly appeared next to us. Raising my head up, I was met with shaggy orange hair that reached all the way to his chest along with the grey metal mask to cover his facial appearance. So you two are Smoker and Hina, right Dara? I've heard of you from Commodore Bartha just now Dara. I'm Bastille. Nice to meet you Dara. Bastille. I certainly recognize that name. It was a name belonging to a vice admiral in the cannon. Though I couldn't remember at which part he came out. Grinning wide, I raised my hand up and shook hand with Bastille, just as you heard, I'm Smoker. Nice to meet you as well. And Hina is Hina. Welcome on the board. Hina nodded with her arms still crossed, but didn't shake Bastille's extended hand. Eventually, Bastille retracted his hand and scratched the back of his head in awkwardness. He then turned and asked me, Did I do something wrong Dara? I shrugged and looked at Hina. Why won't you shake hands with him? Hina motioned me to come closer, which I complied. She then leaned on my ear and whispered, he smells. I instantly understood. Turning at Bastille and spoke while pointing a finger at Hina, she said that you smell like a pile of dog crap owl. Smoker. I was instantly bombarded by the barrage of punches from Hina, causing me to curl up in a ball. Since when did Hina say that he smells like a dog's feces? However, the words got through Bastille already. With a depressive aura around him, he hugged his knees after collapsing on the deck while muttering, I smell. Hina looked at Bastille in an apologetic manner, before lashing out at me again. Smoker, why did you have to say that? To which I dodged this time around by rolling my body across the ground. Muahaha, oh sir, Smoker needs to be punished. I continued rolling as Hina didn't seize her violent tendencies, oh soy, oh soy, oh soy, before my rolling was stopped by the feet of someone. Raising my head up, I was met with the face of Bartha. For few seconds, we stared at each other awkwardly, before I slowly raised my body back up, and went back into the lower level of the ship along with Hina, to continue our mopping. Just now, Bartha shook his head while looking at me with a disdain. I was this close to exploding, chore boys. What are you two doing up here? A stroke of luck it was, especially since he seemed to be in a bad mood for some reason. As we returned back to the hallway, we heard Bartha shouting from the above, you get back down and mop as well. Along with the frightened response from Bastille, why yes sir, and no dinner until you finish the task fuck. What is he? A child. I groaned while reluctantly mopping the floor, someone, please, kill that guy already. Hina looked so done as she grabbed her mop, Hina might become that someone at this rate. It was another peaceful day here, with Bartha becoming more and more unlikable. May I ask a question? I said with a downcast expression while looking at my food plate to the chef who just distributed me the meal. What is it? I pointed at one section of my plate where there lied three slices of melon. Do we have an endless supply of melons? I see it in every single meal. The chef shrugged, what can I do? Melons are Commodore Bartha's favorite. Then came a momentary silence, before the two of us burst out the laughters at the same time. Ha ha ha, nice one there. I can definitely see why he would love them. I said while wigging my eyebrows. Hey, we can't deny the truth can we? Chef said while dumping more melons on my plate. Here, have some more. I stared at the increased pile of sliced melons crying on the inside. I'm freaking sick of melon yes yes. I am a picky eater, whatever you say. Having finished my meal, I walked up to the deck to gaze at the stars, having managed to finish my work quick. This world lacked entertainment, I had to admit. No games, no games, and no games. Oh, and no Wi-Fi too. My hands were itching hard to play those juicy games, which technically didn't exist here. It was one of the downfalls this world had. But the lack of them also made me healthy. Looking at the stars and peacefully reflecting upon my days surely did help to calm myself down. 
and prepare myself for the next day. I believed that this night was going to be the same as any other, until I saw Hina with three adults, who were smoking cheap cigarettes on one side of the deck. Sir, if you mind not telling, why do you smoke? Hina seemed to be asking with genuine curiosity. I saw my grandfather smoking as well, but never got to ask. Does it taste good? The three marines looked at each other, before grinning as they turned back at Hina. Well, it does wonders, one of them spoke up, before asking. How old are you, girl? I am ten, sir. Ten. Eight. Old enough, another one shrugged, before taking out another cigarette, wanna try. This is how we grew up when we were around your age, and before I knew, I was right in front of that marine. Grabbing the cigarette, I ripped them into two, causing the owner of cigarette to cry out, Ah, ah, what do you think you are doing? Cigarettes are bad for your body. They contain strong carcinogens that may induce the development of cancers in your body. And I tell you, exposure to them during the stage of development is especially fatal. I began to sprout out without thinking. And do you know that secondhand smoke is even more carcinogenic than firsthand smoke? Why the hell are you smoking in front of a 10-year-old girl? Are you men children insane? If you're going to smoke, uh, I then stopped, having regained my sense of rationality. In front of me now stood three marines who were visibly displeased. Smoking is bad for health. Hina muttered behind me, going into a deep thought. But I didn't have any time to respond. Hey kid, your name is Smoker if I recall, right? Freaking Smoker discourages smoking what even is this? One of the three then growled, and I know that you're 12 mare, old enough. Another said while cracking his neck as if getting ready for a brawl. The three of them closed in on me, and their faces were filled with unpleasant smiles. But I felt no fear. Are they going to attack me? Honestly speaking, I already was exposed to some degree of fighting. The three muscle jokies back in Logue Town had larger bodies than these three. Additionally, two weeks of stay on this ship helped me learn that most marines here had notably weaker physiques than Bastille and I did. So why would I be afraid of them? Rational or not, I still would have discouraged Hina from smoking. She was my friend, after all. Just three hits. One from each of us. Then we'll let you go. One of the three stated, before throwing his punch at me. And I grabbed it with my drastically smaller sized hand. Huh. Smoking makes you weak, I said casually. So don't ever think of smoking, Hina. Hina wasn't aware. Hina will tell this to grandfather as well. Then, I jumped at the man who just attempted to punch me. Before slamming my fist down at his nose, the blood sprayed out from the man's nostrils. He let out a horrific scream, before falling down on the deck with a thud, having fainted from one punch. A blue what? The other marine looked at his fallen colleague with shock, before looking back at me. What are you? Don't you dare look down on us because we currently are given the title of chore boys, taking a step forward while shaking my right hand to flick away the blood. I snarled at the remaining two. While you three wasted time smoking at our age, we currently are training and training more in order to become far stronger than what you will ever be capable of. The two marines unconsciously took a step back, intimidated by me. Turning around, I motioned Hina to follow. Then I said for the final time, if I see you smoking in front of us ever again, I was going to make an awesome threat to them. However, sided Bartha, who was coming up to the deck drunk, run Hina, and I immediately ran out of the scene in order to avoid trouble. I mean, there is no way those three will spread the news of how they got scared like pussies by one kid, right? Simply put, no, they didn't report. Thank goodness. The night passed, and yet another day of doing an endless amount of chores has begun. At this point, I believe that the three of us successfully earned Bartha's hate. We wore working 15 hours every day, with no pay whatsoever. Is this really how it's supposed to be? Even Bastille, who seemed to be a nice guy, had his expression darkened, yes. I knew that his expression was darkened, although it was hidden behind the mask. How? Don't ask. Maybe he found out, Hina said while using the broom to get the specks of dust off the corners. Found what? Bastille asked. That. I obliterated his son to a bloody pulp. Sighing, I answer honestly. I mean, I practically used him as a punching bag for the final month. You really were a problem kid. Huh? Smoker, Bastille commented, to which I simply shrugged. But raising my head up to see the blue sky outside through the small window. I didn't find my current life all so bad. Although the sail in the Grand Line is harsh, with many experienced marines on board, we were progressing smoothly. Along with my colleagues, whom I have gotten close to, I believe that I finally managed to adjust my mindset to correlate with the logic of this world. Bartha was unlikable. I mean, all he did every day was play with some young women. But hey, it wasn't like I was going to see him much once I arrive at the Marineford, right? There was no need to be so angry about it, and simply endure these chores for some more time. And just like that, I became lax. My sense of alertness, all thoughts that I had prior to the entry into the reverse mountain of how Bartha's upcoming death may be connected with this ship's fate were forgotten. Adapting to the 15 hours of chores on a daily basis, adapting to this environment filled with the weak ones, working extensively without any thought in my mind, and destressing by making meaningless conversations with Hina and Bastille. Before I knew, I've become dull. And perhaps, this was the reason why we became so susceptible to enemies pirates sighted. All Marines, 
Get ready to engage dash the southern attack by the pirates. Upon hearing the urgent shout, all marines began to move rapidly left and right, arming themselves for the upcoming attack. When the three of us ran up to the deck, we were granted the sight of a pirate ship with a size much greater than ours. At the edge of the deck, Bartha stood with his arms crossed. Commodore Bartha. The identified enemies are the recently reported mammoth pirates. The one standing the middle, the marine captain with glasses, who stood on Bartha's right, gulped as he sighted the incredibly obese man on the pirate ship, that's Mammoth the fat so wanted with the bounty of 20 million Beely. Do not worry, Bartha said with a serious face, as he kept his posture confident, and bring me the speaker. Immediately gripping the megaphone brought by one quick marine, Bartha placed it in front of his mouth, and spoke at the approaching pirates, you filthy scums of the sea, I will say it just once. With an intimidating expression on his face, Bartha said in a low tone, surrender immediately, or there will only be deaths however. It seemed to have no effects on the pirates who simply laughed savagely with their weapons high up in the air. But of course, if this was enough to persuade you, you wouldn't have become the pirates in the first place. Bartha therefore ordered all marines fire hold, before shouting in an urgent manner as the pirates all moved away from the center of their ship, revealing numerous civilian hostages, all bruised and injured. Shit, from the back, I muttered while standing next to Hina and Bastille, knowing that the situation has taken a turn for the worse. I can't see properly. What's going on, Smoker? Bastille asked me. Take off your mask and see for yourself, tall guy. I responded with my eyes locked on the front. Boom. Now, with the marines unable to do anything but keep their rifles fully loaded and aimed at the pirate ship, the pirate ship directly collided its wall with our ship. With the hostages tied around the pole of the pirate ship, the leader of the pirates, the obese man known as Mammoth the Fatso, slowly walked up to us with a dark grin on his face. Greetings to you. My friends, Mammoth opened his arms wide as he spoke in front of countless guns, unfazed by them. If you don't know, I am Mammoth from the West Blue. It's been quite a while since I've got to come across you marine folks. And I got to say, I am full of delight at the current moment. Bartha stepped up and faced Mammoth directly, shut your mouth, coward. Upon sighting Bartha's confidence, Hina whispered to me, is a fight going to happen? It's inevitable at the current rate, I replied, calming myself down as much as possible. Running away after sighting hostages is considered something that a marine should never do. If I am not wrong, Bartha values his reputation above all. He knows very well of what consequences await him. If he were to fall back here I gazed at Bartha seriously, and I believe that he indeed does possess some confidence in himself as well. Is it because of his devil fruit ability? Pointing at the hostages, Bartha demanded, let them go. Now, hum, Mammoth placed his hand below his chin jokingly, how about no, then you die. As the atmosphere was becoming more and more intense, with Bartha and Mammoth looking at each other, the marine soldiers kept their orderly positions. On the other hand, the pirates cheered wildly, chugged down their rums, and occasionally placed their weapons against the hostages, as if reminding us of what will happen if we were to begin our attack. But hey, then Mammoth said all of a sudden, we don't really have to fight, you know. Then he pointed his finger all the way back to Hina. I'm willing to make an exchange. In return for the lives of all these people, give me that little girl. What? The freaking hell. I immediately stepped in front of Hina and growled, unable to conceal my rage. I mean, think about it. From what I can see, she's a marine too, right? You save the hostages and become a hero, while she becomes an unfortunate marine who dies during the fight. We have a pedo here, Bastille said with an equally angry tone. But there is no way that Commodore Bartha will consider that. Bartha seemed to be contemplating, much to the shock of the two of us. You are kidding. I whispered in disbelief. He seemed to have noticed our shock gazes, as he quickly turned his head away from us and answered, how about no? Instead, hand over those civilians and surrender my stance won't change. No matter how you try to persuade me. But what happened has already happened. We already witnessed Bartha considering the option, no matter how brief it may have been. I was speechless and so was Bastille. This was enough for us to lose the last streak of respect we had for this man. Man, I thought we could reach an agreement here. Dang it. Mammoth whined as if he believed Bartha was going to accept it, before all of a sudden, snapping his finger. Bang. Immediately after, a bullet was fired from one gun-holding drunk pirate, which pierced through Bartha's exposed right shoulder. Gah! And Bartha immediately reacted with a girly shriek, while holding his bleeding shoulder with his trembling left arm. And medic medic. And just like that, gone was the previously confident man. Bartha was reduced to nothing but a wimpy guy. Even with the spring spring fruit, this was all he managed to become. He come at all. One marine soldier remarked with a dumbfounded expression. Watching the leader of this ship crumbling down into a coward was discouraging. After all, EFFF9 Nyum Nyum Mammoth burst out of laughter upon sighting Bartha's pitiful state. Before raising his club up, boys, begin the raid, yahoo ha ha. I was waiting forever for this, Captain A of Sulgiguego, take all consumables, steal all valuables. Kill all men, and catch all women it's time for the feast along with Mammoth's inhumane scream. All pirates jumped onto our ship fearlessly, with their eyes showing nothing but craziness. At the same time, Puck, Mammoth brutally slammed his club onto Bartha's head, instantly squishing it into a bloody mess. That squirted out the brain matters in a gruesome manner. 
A. All Marines, Fire and Dead Bath is Stead, the Marine Captain with Glasses. The one who previously told the information about the Mammoth Pirates, ordered the soldiers, kill them before they managed to land on us, bang bang bang, signaling the beginning of the bloody clash in the middle of the sea, and in midst of this crossfire. I saw Mammoth's greedy eyes heading to Hina. However, Hina thankfully wasn't scared. Instead, she angrily pushed me away from her front and made a disgusted frown at Mammoth. Don't you dare treat Hina like a weak person, smoker. Hina can handle herself, and age means nothing. Well, ain't you a brave one? I said while quickly looking around our surroundings, trying to see what choices we have here. Bastille seemed just as concerned as me. He asked me while touching his mask with his left hand, what should we do, smoker? With Bartha dead, our side was notably demoralized. The marines had terrified looks on their faces, as Mammoth dragged Bartha's bloody corpse across the marine ship, slowly walking at us. At this rate, it was only a matter of time before we become wiped out, and all women on the ship will be taken too as, if I will watch that happen. Raising up the mop that I held, I broke it in half, before wielding the part without the mopping part. Fight, of course. What else is there to do? This was the battle that we couldn't afford to lose, no matter what. If we want to live here, jumping up in the air to face one pirate, who was dropping on top of us, I slammed the sharp end of the broken stick into that pirate's heart, before kicking the man away from me, while snatching the cutlass in his hands. Tap. I landed back and faced Hina and Bastille. We have to kill all pirates off this ship. Humans tend to fear the unknown. One of the unknown that will never be known to us, is nothing other than the death itself, and due to this, humans not only fear losing their lives, but taking the lives of the others as well. However, in the middle of the battlefield, there is no room for the fear of killing others. Our defensive mechanism values our lives over the lives of the others, and in order to protect ourselves. Such fear of killing others is shut down and, it's no different for me I thought as I drove the cutlass in my hands into the heart of one pirate, who was jumping onto me with a mad expression. Marines in this world kill. This isn't some modern world police, and even back in the earth, they end up killing the severe criminals, whether by mistake, retaliation, or execution. So I steeled myself. With me holding the cutlass and Bastille having took off his metal mask to use it as a weapon, the two of us took a defensive stance against the wave of pirates. Ha! Huh. Bastille punched the face of one running pirate with his mask reinforced fist, sending the man flying in the air while spraying the blood all over. At the same time, I noticed that one pirate at some distance away from us had the barrel of his gun pointing at Bastille, who was a huge target. I immediately shouted, Hina, don't shout. Hina's is hurt, Hina said seriously as, bang, the rifle in her hands which we acquired from a fallen marine fired a shot before the pirate cold, pulled the trigger of his gun, ending his life instantly. Gritting my teeth, I swung the cutlass vertically, from top to bottom, and overwhelmed one sword-wielding pirate, causing the latter to lose his grip on the weapon. Immediately after, the cutlass that I was holding, shattered, due to my poor handling. I threw it away and grabbed the ebon sword, before stabbing it through the heart of the now vulnerable pirate. Ha! I raised my head up instantly, while pulling the bloody sword out of the corpse, fighting in the open is not a good choice. Unfortunately, the marines were losing by a lot. The marine captain with glasses currently had his neck clenched tight by Mammoth, who still was holding onto Bartha's corpse on the other hand. The marine lieutenant already was reduced to a corpse with multiple holes in his body, and still was being shot by the crazed pirates. One by one, the marine soldiers who lost their leaders, were falling, not knowing what to do without an order given. The select few, who were the females, struggled with their hands tied and surrounded by the pirates who gave them the dirty gazes. The hostages tied on the pirate ship, simply looked at this scene with despair, thinking that it was all over. It's only the three of us biting my lips hard in order to keep myself moving. I shouted at Hina and Bastille, go to the inside of the ship. Fighting out in the open against this number is impossible for us. The two of them, who seemed terrified by this sight, nodded upon my call. With me last, the three of us ran down the staircase, and stood at the end of the narrow hallway that we were cleaning just few hours before. Smoker, Bastille muttered to me with a shaky voice, they are dead. All of them. Don't think about it. I replied while wiping the sweats off my body. I placed my left hand on my heart while keeping my grip on the cheap sword, trying to slow down the heartbeat. Are we the only ones left? Hino asked with the terror lingering in her eyes. She was trying to hide her fear, but to no avail. Don't think about it. I could only repeat, just believe that we are going to survive. The footsteps above us were still loud and rapid. The cries of marines, gunshots, the fearsome sounds of sharp weapons cutting through a human flesh. It was an experience that I've never had in my life. Ra ha 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 now. One by one, the pirates were storming down to this hallway where we stood. I stood at the front with Hina right behind me. The steel stood at the end of the hallway behind the two of us. For him being a huge man without any weapon currently, only made him more prone to attacks. In the hallway, long weapon is not ideal I thought as the pirates began to run at us into this hallway, before snapping the sword in half by pressing its blade down with my fort. Taking in a deep breath, I stated, come, ha ha, what can three kids do anyway rushing in? 
I stabbed the broken sword through the frontmost pirate's heart, before pulling the sword out by kicking him. The stabbed pirate fell on the floor, and the pirates who were following tripped due to the corpse below them. Without a stop, I slammed my left foot, hard, on the neck of one of the fallen pirates, while stabbing the broken sword through the neck of another. With me momentarily immobilized, another running pirate attempted to slam his giant axe on my head, but it was stopped by the narrow wall. Immediately after bang, the bullet fired by Hina pissed through his head. Using that gap of time to pull the broken sword out and take a step back, I looked back up at the front where there seemed to be no end to the number of pirates. Simultaneously, boom, boom, from the ceiling right above us. The banging noises could be heard, they were trying to attack us from the above. The steel. I shouted at the back, while wildly slashing the broken sword at the horde of pirates at my front, you found anything useful yet? Ah, here. The steel, who was rushing through the rooms and structures behind Hina and me, finally returned with a couple of kitchen knives in his hands, and slided one at my direction. Leaping back, I dodged an axe that was thrown by the frontmost pirate before stepping my foot over the sliding kitchen knife to stop it, and quickly wielded with my other free hand now, holding two short swords. Boom. Then, the ceiling right above me broke and two pirates, who were grinning wildly, jumped down at me. Coupled with the third pirate who was running at me front the hallway, the situation was getting worse and worse. He and I cried while dodging the slashes of cutlasses made by the two from the top, before stabbing the broken sword and kitchen knife into each of them. Bang. Upon my call, Hina fired another bullet to the third pirate that I was unable to deal with. Leaving the kitchen knife and broken sword still embedded on two now dead pirates, I ran back while opening my palms at Bastille, who placed two more kitchen knives. Upon my motion, Hina and Bastille too began to retreat backward, knowing that we won't be able to hold out in the hallway any longer. Is there any hope here? During a run into the deeper part of the ship, one thought popped up in my mind. How did these three survive in the first place in the cannon? Smoker then, Hina and I were forced to stop as Bastille stopped moving, with his back facing us. Looking grimly at the approaching pirates from my back, I peeked the other way to see why Bastille stopped and sighted. It's the end for you. Kids, Mammoth the Fatso standing in front of Bastille, along with other pirates behind him as well. We were now surrounded in a narrow hallway in both parts. ECH, already. I struggled to keep my face stoic. There are two ways to enter the intersection of this ship. I thought that it would take some time until all marines above are dealt with, but it ended much quicker than what I speculated. Did I make a wrong decision? And what a detrimental circumstance we were lied within now. Move up. The deck is packed with tons of pirates. Move down. There are many layers to go through until we manage to reach the sea below even, and in the Grand Line, being lost in the sea means almost a guaranteed death. Smoker before my transmigration technically die from this. Hina immediately raised up her rifle and pointed it at Mammoth. But strangely, the pirates didn't react, and laughed in amusement instead, driving us into a confusion. Shoot it, without any hesitation. I whispered at Hina, and she nodded. Bang. Another bullet was fired from the gun to Mammoth at the point-blank range. However, clang. Along with the sound of metal clanging, the bullet was bounced off of Mammoth's obese torso before crashing into a wall. Heh heh, did I not tell you? Mammoth rubbed his palms together with a shrewd smile. I am a hard man, having eaten the hard and hardened fruit. With the thought alone, I can harden any section of body, so hard that even the bullets cannot penetrate through. The palms that he rubbed together were now metallic gray in color. Hina's eyes widened in horror. Unable to keep her facade, she dropped the rifle to the floor and fell on her knees. The still tightly gripped on the kitchen knives that he was carrying. But his arms shook. He was in no different situation than Hina. Despair. Such thoughts began to corrupt us from the inside, and I wondered if there was anything left that I could do. Surrender. In usual cases, I would have killed you already. But, Mammoth then stated as if not having even felt Hina's bullet, while holding his right hand out, you two boys seem to hold quite a potential. If you join now, I will allow you to become the no.2 and no.3 of my crew. Mammoth didn't mention Hina, and judging by those greedy looks in his eyes, I knew what he was thinking of. Disgusting that was the thought that entered me. This is the so-called freedom of the pirates. Such a thought was so strong that it even defeated my desire to survive. If living on means giving up my sense of morality and joining this filthy pirate crew, then I'd rather die. And before I knew, I was spitting on Mammoth's face. Why don't you go run in hell instead, Fatso? Mammoth raised his hand up and touched his cheek where I spat upon. The grin on his face instantly died down, replaced by a cold emotion. Then die, kiddo. And the next thing I could perceive was, boom, a punch on my abdomen. Smoker the anguish-filled cries from Hina and Bastille. Ha 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 the crazed and drunken laughs from the enemies. Well, what about you, big guy? You better answer well. If you don't want to be given the same treatment are your friend. The mocking voice of Mammoth. I blinked my blurry eyes, trying to gain sense of what just happened. The blood was dripping out from my mouth, signaling that I currently acquired the internal injury. It. Hurts I couldn't help but think weakly as my mind was halfway into the realm of unconsciousness. But I have to help them. Never, suckers Bastille then screamed. Before launching his huge body at Mammoth, Ryurkak, what an idiot only to be choked by Mammoth, who effortlessly snatched Bastille by the neck. 
Weakly raising my head up, I looked to my left and right with the blurry vision that I had. It seemed that Mammoth's punch made me crash through a couple walls, before landing at this pantry, it seemed. HHH Hina screamed as she was lifted up by the hair from Mammoth's grip. My mind felt hazy. My eyes were half-lidded, unable to handle the current stress that I was going through. But my hands twitched. I was still alive, and my peers were suffering. My eyes continued to wander off randomly, around this pantry that I currently sat within. Melons melons and more melons hair. The room was filled with numerous barrels, which all contained melons. I couldn't help but chuckle, before coughing out blood due to stressing my lungs. Melons. Boy, you surely are weak for being this huge. Even now, Mammoth was talking as he held both Bastille and Hina at the same time. And girl, quit trying to bite me. The nicer you are, the better treatment you will receive. Got that? Fuck you my eyes locked onto a particular barrel, filled with melons. It was filled to the brim to an extent where a couple of melons were peeking out. From them, there existed one odd one. Strange patterns ugly to an extent where the sight alone makes me want to puke, and before I knew, I was moving. I was crawling my way to where that barrel lied, using all strength that I got. This is it. I instinctively knew that this was our only way out. The reason why Smoker, Hina, and Bastille still were alive in the cannon. This had to be the way. Jeez, girl. I'm telling you. Biting won't do anything to me. I already told you. Didn't I? I am a hard man and I am yum yum. HHHH Hina let out a scream. But I didn't look. Placing my focus solely on the odd fruit within one barrel. I crawled and crawled. Time mattered. Haha, -ha, I told you before. Captain doesn't know how to handle a girl. Hey, Captain, you are supposed to be nice to her. You know. Like you gotta touch places. Keka, I was solely motivated by nothing but a rage. The path in which I crawled by was colored by my own blood. At this rate... I knew that I would end up dead, but I couldn't stop here. At this point, even if I were to die, I wanted to murder every single pirate on this ship as painfully as possible. And finally, here I was, with my bloody hand on top of the old fruit that I sighted. With my hazy vision filled with red due to my fury, munch, I used all my strength to take a bite on it. The horrific taste? I didn't have any spare attention to focus on such a trivial thing. What really mattered was the fact that I ate the devil fruit the mysterious fruit that granted its consumer a power. And, melon white cloud-like patterns this has to be the smoke smoke fruit. Just when I thought, I saw, the tips of my bloody fingers slowly morphing into the thin smokes, slowly traveling up in the air. And with the power of Loja at my disposal, I knew that we had a ways out. This boy fainted. Ha, huh, Mammoth said lazily as he looked at Bastille, who passed out due to the lack of oxygen. Loosing his grip, Mammoth let go of Bastille's neck, and had the latter collapse to the floor. Turning around while still holding onto Hina's hair, with Hina thrashing as much as she could, Mammoth said to his crew, Do whatever you want with those two, I don't care. But for the next few hours don't call me. Well, of course, Cap, one pirate said while rubbing his hands together excitedly, Enjoy your time PSSSSSS. All pirates, including Mammoth, stopped upon hearing a bizarre noise from some distance away, through the hole created by Mammoth punching Smoker previously. Boy, Mammoth motioned his head at one pirate, go check it out. I, I Hina helplessly looked at the direction of the noise as well, with her eyes reddened from tears. Then, from within, white out. The smoke suddenly swarmed into the hallway from that hole, filling the space entirely. Ugly, what is this? Captain, what should we do? The smoke was so thick that nothing could be seen even when the pirates were next to one another. The hole fell into a chaos, with pirates simultaneously panicking out. Seriously, shut the hell up, all of you. Mammoth, unfazed by this, simply shouted. It's just a smoke then came. Indeed, it's just a smoke made up of the burned particles. A weak voice, which was very familiar to Hina. Which means the high density of smoke then, within this thick smoke, Mammoth's eyes widened upon sighting one bloody white head boy, Smoker, glaring at him murderously, can do this as well. The smokes all around the hallway began to gather and grow even more dense, forming specific shapes. Mammoth and all the other pirates found themselves bound by the huge hands formed out of dense smokes. Bang. In this smoke, one bullet was fired at Smoker. However, it simply phased through his body, much to everyone's shock. Boy Mammoth shouted with bloodshot eyes, so you ate as well. The devil fruit smoker slowly walked step by step, with each step leaving the footprint made of blood. Stopping in front of Mammoth who was held by the smoke hand, Smoker looked at Hina who was still held by the hair. She was on verge of crying. Let her go, Smoker said in a low tone. Mammoth, who was looking at Smoker with a panic, suddenly calmed down. Grinning shrewdly, he stated, But your smoke is too soft, isn't it? It may be useful, but not to a hard man like me. Smoker's forehead instantly popped veins upon hearing Mammoth, expressing his imminent rage. Frowning deeply, while gritting his teeth so hard that they shook, Smoker raised his hand up and placed it over Mammoth's arm that held Hina's hair, then burn. Then, the horrific searing sound was heard to everyone. Mammoth's face was frozen, unable to perceive what was going on. It initially wasn't painful, but the sear continued as if the food was being slow cooked. ESSSS all pirates, held by the smoke hands, watched as the smokes were emitted from Mammoth's wrist that smoker held tightly, and eventually, G-Gar, 
Mammoth began to express pain, with the slow burn finally reaching his nerves. He instinctively hardened his wrist, but the effect of hardening did not reduce the extent of pain that he was receiving. He thrashed his body to his left and right, but the grip of the smoke on his body was especially strong, due to the small space of hallway serving, to reinforce the smoke density. Finally, by reflex, Mammoth let go of Hina's hair, causing her to drop to the floor. The first thing she did, upon becoming free, was to look at Smoker with her body still trembling from the terrifying experience. Smoker, drenched by blood, said weakly to her, Take some rest, Hina. Just when he said so, one pirate began to cry helplessly. I, I can't breathe. That's when all pirates realized they were being suffocated. I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm as sorry, please. The hallway was filled with nothing but screams and cries filled with despair. The situation was now entirely in reverse, and Mammoth wasn't an exception either. Ha ha. Mammoth's breathing's quick end, with the air becoming scarce. Smoker intentionally pushed all the air to the space where Hina and Bastille lied, in order to give painful deaths by suffocation to all these bound pirates. Mammoth hardened his entire body, but it did nothing to help him in the situation. The strength of hardened hardened fruit was to make him resistant to weapons, and amplify the damage of his own attacks. By rendering his body hard, his basal strength was still the same, and it wasn't enough to escape from Smoker's smokes. There was nothing but silence. One by one, the pirates slanched with blue faces, having ran out of oxygen. Thud. When the death of a pirate was confirmed, Smoker released his smoke hand causing that corpse to drop to the floor. This intensified the degree of fear within the pirates, knowing that there was nothing that they could do. But wait as they die slowly. Thud. 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 Mem -m 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 -h. Mammoth, with his eyes teary due to the smokes and lack of oxygen, shook his head wildly as if trying to struggle for the final time. Then, his eyes took a spun, and his head was knocked down, losing all strength. He ended up facing the same fate as his crew. Leaning down, Smoker lifted up one kitchen knife that Bastille dropped. Slowly walking to now dead Mammoth, Smoker sliced the man's neck and decapitated the head. Now, with all pirates having died from suffocation, Smoker slammed the kitchen knife onto the nearby window, and expelled the smoke out, allowing Hina and unconscious Bastille to breathe. Hina continued to watch Smoker with a shock as the latter slowly began to climb the staircase, while holding Mammoth head with his left hand. Abui, where are you going? Hina asked with a worry. To finish off the rest, Mocha replied without turning back, and continued to walk up. Ha ha, my lungs were burning. I could tell that I stressed my body beyond its limit. If I were to account for how much blood I lost, it would be strange that I managed to stay alive up until now the logic of Earth didn't apply here. But there still were many pirates on the deck above. Frankly speaking, I wasn't sure if I had enough strength left in me to deal with them, whether or not I ate the logotype devil fruit. Ha ha. Still, I managed to reach the end of the stairs. Another round of fight, with all those pirates against me alone, was about to start Creek. Hey, boy, are you alright? Or so I thought. Him in front of me stood one extremely huge man, packed with enormous muscles all over his body. Spiky black hair, thick beard, huge fists one look was enough for me to identify this man. Monkey D. Garp. Thank goodness. I sighed with a small smile on my face, relieved by the marine hero's appearance. I found my body relaxing as I lost my stand and began to fall down. Well ha ha, you had quite a wild fight, didn't you? Then everything went black. Gup, who was grinning as Smoker finally relaxed and lost consciousness, quickly grabbed the boy before he ended up falling down the stairs. Then his grin faded away, replaced by Grimace. Who's in charge here, for the marine platoon of this size to be obliterated by the pirate crew? led by a mere 20 million. Garp's eyes were locked onto dead Bartha, and couldn't help but say darkly TSK, another case of promotion given by those corrupted bastards. I see. But he quickly placed his huge hand over his face, trying to suppress his rising anger for the lost lives. Taking a deep breath, Garp turned his head back to the staircase into the ship, where Hina was wobbly running from within. Good to see that you are alive, Hina. Garp formed a gentle smile on his face. Hina, who was running with nothing but a worry that Smoker may have killed himself, visibly relaxed upon sighting the latter in Garp's arms. Vice Admiral Garp. Phew Hina sighed in relief, Hina glad. Consider yourselves lucky. Garp, while placing Smoker on his left shoulder, took out a letter from his sleeve. I've come to deliver you a letter, and not by chance. If not for this, I wouldn't have come all the way here. Hina expressed her confusion. Why would Vice Admiral Gup personally deliver a letter? Well, Har Gup scratched the back of his head with his eyes appealing sadness. It's only right that I, as a friend, do this personally. It was his last wish, after all. As Hina took the letter from Gup's hand, Gup stated, Your grandfather passed away. Hina. Hina froze on the spot, unable to believe what she just heard. How much time did it pass by? When I came to feel the sensations, especially the sharp pains around my body, and became aware that I finally regained my consciousness, I couldn't figure out where exactly I was. Finding my eyes closed, I ended my surrounding darkness by opening my eyes. The bright light entered causing me to squint my eyes. After the momentary adjust, I found myself in a room that seemed like a ward, unfamiliar ceiling. Raising my head up, I saw that my torso was completely wrapped around the white clothes, and judging by there being no stain of blood, I could conclude that my wounds have been healed. If I were to recall what happened back then Monkey D. Garp, although I only got one look before fainting, 
I knew for certain that the man standing there was Garp, and no one else. Considering his status and strength, all problems must have been resolved, and Hina and Bastille were alive as well. Sighing in relief, I lie back down. I wasn't some rash boy that runs up and screams are my friends okay? To whoever he comes across. If we are out of a trouble, might as well enjoy it, right? Oh, right? And I just remembered, that I now was the user of Smoke Smoke Fruit. It gave me a weird feeling. That me, who was living a normal life back in Earth, was now possessing a supernatural ability that could be considered unreal. Smoke? Huh. Upon my will. My right hand morphed into white smoke, which moved around the room as I ordered. What a strange experience it was, to see your own hand move around the room freely, without any human limit. And you wasted a powerful ability like this, smoker. I couldn't help but chuckle while watching the show my hand was giving. White blow this, white blow that, seriously. I was starting to have fun now, retracting my hand back to my body. I then expelled smoke from my left hand, letting it fill the room. Smoke is essentially a gas that is produced by an incomplete combustion reaction due to the lack of oxygen. The ability to spontaneously produce smoke means, if I were to supply enough heat to the smoke, it will combust into a fire. How strong is that I then froze, upon noticing a lit candle that was lying on the table at my right, shit. The smoke then exploded into a frightening fit of fire, instantly spreading all over the room. Immediately after, the fire alarm bell rang loudly, as the water poured out from the ceiling, quickly subduing the fire. Boom. What's wrong? At the next moment, a huge man whom I came across previously, Monkey D. Garp, suddenly made his appearance by breaking the door opened and stopped upon sighting the messy state that the room was in. Garp then turned his face at me, before suddenly exploding into laughter, or ha ha ha. With a snot dropping down from my nose, and my face locked into a surprised expression, I slowly turned and looked at myself in the mirror. There was a boy with white-colored broccoli-like hair, so huge that the head below seemed tiny. Chai, my name is Bastille. I said out of instinct. So, walking next to Garp in the hallway, who was grinning with his hands in his pockets, I asked, where are we, Vice Admiral Garp? Marine Base G4? This was the closest from where you were found. Garp answered casually, before asking me, so you a smoker, eh? No, I'm Bastille, sweating profusely. I turned my head away from Garp. All right, then let me ask you one thing, Bastille. He fell for it. I found my eyes shaking as Garp continued his words. I heard from Hina that you were unconscious, while the other guy named Smoker defeated all those pirates. Garp picked his left ear with his pinky finger as we walked to who knows where. Among them was a named pirate, Mammoth the Fatso who had a considerable sum of bounty on his head. Garp turned to look at me and said with a knowing grin, and since Smoker defeated that man, the bounty or reward for the case of Marines naturally goes to him. I just wanted to confirm this information with you, yes. It is true, indeed. I nodded with my utmost seriousness, and what did I say just before? My name is Smoker. Pleased to meet you, Vice Admiral Garp. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So you indeed were Smoker. Garp nodded, acting as if he didn't know. Then, he pointed his thumb back and stated, But unfortunately, the destruction that you've made just now, will cost approximately 20 million to repair. What? No way. I immediately retorted. How the hell can a repair cost that much bonk? I found myself on the floor, groaning in pain due to the lump that was formed on my head by Garp's fist. Medical tools are expensive. Garp said while whistling with an unnatural expression. This man surely sucked at lying. No, they aren't. I know more than you. So shut your mouth, brat man child lousy brat. And just like that during my first official conversation with Garp, I was ripped off 20 million beerly. Fuck. In the ruined ward where Smoker previously stayed during his rejuvenation, the set of footsteps could be heard beyond its entrance. Eventually, three marines revealed themselves at the entrance. Hina, Bastille, and a man who seemed to be a medic in service. Hina, in particular, was seen to be holding a plate full of food in particular. What happened here? Hina, upon coming to cite this horrific state that the room was reduced to, asked to the medic urgently, did Smoker get attacked? Wow, this looks like a disaster. Bastille commented as he looked around the room, trying to see if there is any clue to gain an inside of what happened here. The medic seemed to be panicking, not knowing what to do. He looked at Hina, who was glaring at him, and gulped unconsciously, finding the 10-year-old girl frightening. Don't worry, your friend is fine, and in this situation, one middle-aged man, wearing the dandy-looking beige suit and hat, made his appearance while holding a cane in his left hand. His walk spoke nothing but elegance, and although Bastille had no idea who he may be, it was a different case with Hina. Vice Admiral Boggard. Hina immediately saluted while holding the food plate with her left hand. Long time no see, Hina. And I've heard of you as well. But still, Boggard made a slight nod while placing his free hand on the medic's shoulder. No need to pick on this innocent medic of ours. Your friend is fine and is currently at the training ground. Excuse me, sir. But what did you say just now? Bastille immediately spoke up in a worry. He was badly injured when we last saw him. And the first thing he does upon finally regaining his consciousness is to go to a training ground. Hina knows Smoker, Vice Admiral Boggard. Hina denied Boggard's words. He may be aggressive at times. 
but he knows better than to stress his body during the period of recover. And as for that, how Bogart adjusted his hat while sighing. I believe that he was forced to do so, by Gupsan. Turning around, Bogart said to the medic, you are discharged. Go take some rest, before motioning at Hina and Bastille, follow me. I will show you where he is, Bogart began to walk ahead. I needed to go see Gutsen anyway. What are we doing here? I couldn't help but ask as I stood in the middle of the empty training ground in front of Gup, who had his arms crossed. Even without any word from the huge man, I felt the dread creeping in. Knowing this man's character, oh, call it an old man's curiosity. Gup grinned giddily. I want to know your potential. It isn't before I even had the time to retort. Gup launched himself as me, with the intent to fight, come at me with all you've got. But you are the one coming at me, old man. I found myself in a huge panic. Although I felt that my body has practically recovered fully. I didn't know if it was safe enough too for me to engage in another fight, not that being at my best changes anything against this man. Boom. I jumped as high as possible, but still, the gusts of air that exploded forth from Gup's punch were enough to blow me away. The sheer force behind his attack was simply incredible, and I was left unfounded. Furthermore, what was even more shocking was that Gup clearly held back against me. By a lot, I saw right when I jumped up Gup's eyes moving along, and for some reason, I found myself annoyed by this fact, was it that I was slowly becoming impulsive and rash, akin to Smoker in the cannon. You wanna fight? Although I had the idea that Gup was testing me right now, I growled in the midair, as Gup looked up at me in a relaxed position, fine then. The lower half of my body then morphed into smokes upon my will. Subsequently, I propelled myself at Gup, using the pressure generated by the continuously emitted smokes from my lower half. White launcher. Gup watched my propulsion at him from the sky, without even taking a punching stance. Closing into the man, my arms exploded into a huge mass of smokes, which instantly shrouded both Gup and me at the same time. White however, before I could do anything, Gup suddenly barked at me. Quit using your fruit ability. That's not what I want to see. And just when he said that, I found my face being punched by Gup's huge fist. Boom. My body was instantly knocked down to the ground, and a single punch was enough to show me the stars that circled around my head. Fuck I totally forgot about Haki, ugh listen. Gup placed his hands on his sides while shouting at me. You got one hell of a fruit, I admit. However, over-reliance on such an ability will do nothing but hinder your growth. They were simple, yet face-slapping words. My eyes widened, and I couldn't help but feel as if an electrifying jolt has entered me. Smoker, in the canon, was inferior. To those without Haki, he was the White Hunter, the Nightmare. However, to those with Haki, he was nothing but a cannon fodder too. Who's number one, you ask? Toshigi, of course, back to the topic. Gut was right. If I wanted to become strong, I needed to restrict the use of my devil fruit. Honing the basics especially my physical prowess came first and foremost. Taking in a deep breath, I wiped the blood off of my nose and stood back up, glaring at Gut once again. Heh, that's more like it. Gut said with a pleased tone as he saw my determination, before motioning his hand at me. If you manage to land a strike on me, I will give your 20 million back. What do you say? Rayaya, I roared like a wild animal as I ran toward Gup, having lost all my sense. Using my momentum, I pushed my fist out to Gup's nose, intending to punch him. Tap. Much better, Gup stated as he stopped my punch with his pinky finger, and I saw beforehand, him using that exact pinky finger to pick on his ear and nose. Rayo losing my sense, I threw flurries of punches and kicks without any rationality whatsoever. What was even more infuriating was the fact that Gup didn't even bother to dodge them. All my hits landed on the man's chest, and he wasn't reacting at all. Ah, uh, Gup instead sighed with his eyes closed, nice massage there, brat. Huff huff eventually, I ran out of energy, feeling that my head was spinning. I fell on the ground while breathing heavily. Gup stood in front of me, with his eyes gleaming in wonders. Well ha ha. Then, Gup laughed pointing his finger at me childishly all of a sudden, you look so pitiful right now. Shut up, old man I immediately barked back with a tick mark. For some reason, I found it awfully hard to keep myself calm in front of him. But I admit, maybe this was the so-called manly talk. Only a short time passed since I met Gup, but he already felt close to me. It really was a strange feeling to have. Gup's laugh died down, and he leaned down to look at me from closer, causing me to wonder if he was feeling the same way. Smiling, he then asked all of a sudden, Hey, Smoker, do you want to be my disciple? What? Not having expected such an offer, I was rendered frozen. But aren't I on my way to be taught by Zephyr, known as one of the greatest instructors? On the other hand, Gup that's right. He was someone who believed that falling from cliff could make you strong. Hell no, I said with a pale face. No, no, no. Looking back up at Gup's outstretched hand, I was about to refuse it. Not that you have a choice, Tear. But Gup grabbed my hand and forcibly shook it. I immediately turned my hand into a smoke to escape from his hand. But he casually grabbed onto my smoke turned hand using Haki and continued to shake it. Don't worry, Smoker. Gup grinned as he finally let my hand go. 
I will make you the strongest marine to ever have existed. Oh, shit. Then, from my side, a voice was heard. Garp and I both turned to the source of the sound and found the middle-aged man, wearing a beige coat and hat covering his mouth due to his slip. Hina and Bastille too were standing on the side, and they were looking at that man with dumbfounded expressions. Chem HM, I apologize for my slip. Lowering his hat, the man stated in a monotone. They resumed their walk at the two of us. Garp stood up with the grin still intact on his face and awaited them. You're quick as always, Boggard. Garp greeted the beige man with a friendly manner. Of course, Boggard leaned his head slightly downward maintaining his stoic expression. Hey smoker, you alright? Meanwhile, Bastille waved at me as him and Hina came in front of me. Grabbing the hand that Bastille reached out for me, I stood back up. Sighing, I said while looking at the two of them, Hey guys I think I'm fucked. Although my day in G4 began in quite a mess, upon Garp leaving with Boggard to discuss about whatever important matter it may be, the experience has quickly become enjoyable. The delectable dishes produced by finest chefs, along with the opportunity to look around this large facility with Bastille as the tour guide, who knew ins and outs of this place. With my two closest colleagues, I got to take a nice rest for the day, free from the tiring duties of a chore boy. And now, we stood at the top of the building, watching as the sun set by. Starting from tomorrow, we will be heading out of here to the Marineford, tagging along with Garp and Boggard. A funeral will be held Hina, and Bastille told me the one for none other than Hina's only remaining family, her grandfather. What was your grandfather like? Leaning onto the rail and gazing at the setting sun, I asked. He was loud, brash, and had a childish tendency. Many Marines feared him, and called him the Red Devil who knows no mercy. Hina chuckled as her eyes were filled with melancholy. But to Hina, he was the best grandfather that I could ask for. I see. And as a simplistic man that he was, he envisioned Hina raised her hand up and reached up top Sky, the lawful justice. He believed in the good trait of humanity, that whoever is evil can't be fixed by being locked behind bars. Hina turned at me and smiled, it's pretty dumb, isn't it? Not necessarily. I suggested, if I were to be imprisoned for the rest of my life, I'd rather appeal to the authority as having changed and hope for getting an early release, I don't think that's possible, Smokadara. They still cut off my words. Frankly, I too agreed with his words. Yawning as the sun was now almost set, I asked the two of them, what about you two then? The two of them looked at me, what goal, what ideal, out of curiosity? I asked, what's the reason you joined the Marine? Oh, that Bastille pumped his fist up high with enthusiasm. I still remember that very day Dara. When I first came across the story of Sora, Warrior of the Sea, the cool transformation with a seagull, beating down all those bad Germa 66 villains, I immediately knew that Sora was who I had to become Dara. Sora. I faintly remembered that it was a comic strip published in the World Economic Newspaper. Considering that Sanji and Law 2 read this comic in the canon, it surely was kept alive for a very long time. So you want a robot seagull as your partner? Hina rolled her eyes, to which Bastille immediately reacted with his eyes sparkling from beyond the metal masks. You read it too, Dara. Of course, Hina huffed with her arms crossed, the comic was based on the exploits of real-life marines. As the future marine officer, I can't overlook the feats that my seniors achieved. Oh, I didn't know that, Bastille exclaimed with a surprise, before continuing his statement. But yeah, just like Sora, my goal is to become so strong that even six Germa 66 dudes can't defeat me Dara. Only six. I raised my eyebrow questioningly. Bastille immediately reacted with a passion, hey? Even six is a lot. You know, there is this one dude in particular, known as Stealth Black, and he can freaking turn invisible Dara. Alright, alright. I conceded immediately, unable to handle Bastille's word bombardments, my bad. Good luck on becoming Sora, you definitely got this oh ho. I snapped my finger in realization, there must be human human fruit, model. Sora, warrior of the sea, out there somewhere. You should eat it before anyone else. Don't take me for an idiot, smoker. Bastille jokingly attempted to slap the back of my head, but it simply phased through as my head morphed into smoke. Annoyed by my smug face as it reformed from smoke, Bastille motioned his chin at Hina. What about you, Dara? Hina, as if she was waiting for this, spoke with conviction. Hina believes that the classification of pirates into two groups, Morganeers and Peace Mains, is valid. However, since there are far too many pirates in this world, arrest all of them first. Impelled Down won't be able to contain all of them, Dara. Bastille immediately pointed out a possible fault. So sort them out. Hina immediately replied, immediately execute the Morganeers, and imprison all the Peace Mains, who may be able to reform. You aren't too different from your grandfather. I commented after hearing her words. Hina supposes so. I inwardly thought that her ideal was too inflexible, and that the classification into two types wasn't always accurate. However, I didn't say it out loud. Now, the sun was gone from our sight, and along with the cold wind that breezed through us from the sea, the twinkling stars revealed themselves above, generating marvelous scenery. And you, Hina, who was gazing at the stars, asked, we've told you ours. But you didn't. As for me as Bastille and I similarly looked up at the stars, I muttered, initially, I joined the marine to survive. Survive? Bastille said, huh, that's new Dara. Well, I was practically homeless after my entire hometown was burned away. 
and there was nothing remaining, except for my very own grandfather's gravestone. Recalling back the memories that Smoker left me before my transmigration, I stated, so I sailed out of that hell, and almost drowned myself. When I miraculously woke up alive, I somehow was in Logue Town. In order not to die by starvation, I joined Marine. My gaze lowered, now recalling the battle the three of us experienced against Mammoth Pirates. But you know, our fight was the first time I've truly been exposed to the malicious nature of the pirates. I thought of what would have happened if we were powerless, if we were helpless beings without any training and such thoughts surely did frighten me. That's what I said to those muscle trios back in Logue Town. But perhaps, I was saying that to myself, not to them. Now that I have strength, now that I'm capable, I have a dream, in front of Hina and Bastille. I grinned while clenching my hands. I want to save them the helpless ones, who are unable to do anything in front of ruthless power. Isn't that a standard protocol of Marine? Hina, who was listening to my words, said with deadpan, protect the weak from the pirates. You're just stating common sense. Not necessarily. I shook my head, the root of marine protocol is the ideal of justice. And in truth, I don't believe in justice at all. Huh. Bastille tilted his head, not understanding my statement. Justice is a set standard, which helps us to distinguish what is right and wrong. However, such standard is set by the victors. I said while thinking of the world government, the victors themselves may not necessarily be good. Looking at Hina, I continued, I don't seek to conform. Whether someone is right or wrong, I won't make any judgment until I get to experience that person personally. Sometimes, the pirates may be the innocent ones. Just like Bartha, there certainly exist the corrupted marines. Nothing is absolute in this world, and there always are exceptions. Bastille scratched the back of his head before saying, Yeah, I don't get what you are saying. Hina, however, seemed to have understood what I was saying. Are you saying that the world government is in the wrong? Finding that speaking any further may be dangerous. I shrugged in the end, that depends on how you interpret it. Hina stayed silent for a while, before breaking out a smile. You really are a trouble, smoker Kun. Kun. Bastille raised his eyebrow. Hina immediately turned red and said in an embarrassment, F forget what I just said. Well ha ha. You three definitely look much better than when I first found you. Under the blue sky, full of white clouds, one huge marine ship was ready to sail out. On top of its deck, we stood strictly on the deck, listening as Garp spoke with his signature grin. On Garp's sign, Boggard, who stood with his beige hat covering his eyes, stated in a monotone, but try to tone your excitement down, especially since we are going to attend the funeral soon. Sir, Hina said while looking at the front, you can have that rest assured. It's the funeral of Hina's very own grandfather, after all. Boggard nodded stoically and continued speaking, it will take about a week for us to arrive the Marineford. Garpsen decided to relieve your duties as the chore boys, so use your free time wisely, understood. Suddenly, Garp, in my eyes, looked like an angel. Sir, yes sir. The three of us answered simultaneously, barely managing to keep our joy suppressed. Satisfied, Bogard walked away to check up on the other Marines, while Garp remained with us. Relax, you brats. Bogard isn't as uptight as you think. Garp, lifting up a huge rice cracker with his right hand, took a crunchy bite out of it, before suddenly lifting me up by grabbing the back of my shirt, and you will be with me, smoker. Training? Huh? Hanging up in the air, I said with a groan. All my plans for the week, which I was daydreaming of, instantly vanished into the thin air. I was too hopeful, wasn't I you got it? What about the other two? Gart turned to Hina and Bastille, and asked, do you want to join? The two of them shook their heads so fast that I thought they might break their necks. Gart turned back at me. Just you, I suppose. I squinted my eyes at the two. Hina returned my gaze by holding her tongue out, and Bastille rubbed the back of his head apologetically. He, I ended up laughing warily at Garp. Go easy on me, please. Well ha ha, of course. On the deck of the ship, one young boy with spiky white hair and hazel-colored eyes, Smoker, was seen to be yelling out loud. While doing an endless series of push-ups with Garp, a fellow with a very huge body, Sitting on top of this tiny boy, the marines were watching the scene with nothing but shock, amazed that in contrast to the boy's terrified screams, he was somehow managing Garp's unbelievable training routine. Perhaps he didn't really mean it when he let out those screams, and they were a method for him to gain strength. Smoker's arms were shaking, and the deck below him was drenched with the sweat that relentlessly poured from the boy. And yet, even under this intense stress, Smoker didn't give up bent his arms down, and straightened them back up completing another push-up. Just as I thought while enjoying a rice cracker, Garp grinned while observing the boy underneath him. You have the potential, smoker. Hey Huff Garp Sensei Huff by the way, those with talent show a fearsome rate of growth. They tend to make higher up than most of people. Garp believed that there existed a variety of talents ranging from an inherently tough body to high natural born intelligence. Then, there are those with unbending willpower. The hard workers who overcome their limits to match those with talents. The most prominent marine of this type who came into Gulp's mind was Zephyr. You know Huff about that 20 million Huff Beely and you, Smoker, have an incredible talent, and your will far surpasses your peers. Without a doubt, you will grow as the core figures of marine in the future, and it is my job to prevent you from straying away from that path. Looking up at the blue sky as Smoker continued his endless push-ups, Gulp thought, it feels as if Roger's death took something away from me. This sense of hollowness the time has come for my generation to fade away, 
entrusting the justice of this world to the next generation. However, Garp's facial expression darkened as he recalled one man, Sakazuki. That fellow he harbors a dangerous ideal. Yet another man with both talent and willpower no one in his generation is able to go on par with him, not even Borsalino and Kuzan. The bounty from Half Mammoth at this point, he wasn't even sure where exactly Sakazuki stood in terms of strength. Did he awaken his fruit? Did he master the advanced Haki techniques? I Huff have a great idea Huff you know Gup had an itch that Sakazuki was going to do something soon. Something that was considered immoral and ridiculous to him. Why don't Huff? We ahhhhh Gup, growing a tick mark on his forehead, lifted up a huge dumbbell on the side, causing Smoker to scream from the significantly increased weight above him. Shut up and focus on your exercise if you got the energy to talk, brat. What the hell, old man? Shifting his attention, Gup looked at Hina and Bastille, who were roaming around the ship, learning the ins and outs of various tools and techniques used to sail. The standard of marines is falling, Gup thought grimly, while the standard of pirates is rising. Intelligence and knowledge were indeed important. However, what drove marines was none other than their determination, Hina and Bastille just like any other, clearly didn't have the motivation that Gup saw through Smoker. Perhaps they were using their time wisely in Boggard's eyes. However, going around the ship, observing and learning many things they were all useless in Gup's eyes. He swallowed the entire rice cracker that he was holding. Oh well, I suppose that I will make you even stronger then, Smoker, in order to offset the imbalance. He reached out for another huge dumbbell, with an evil smile on his face. One week after what a quick sail it was. Apparently, there were some sort of propellers attached below the ship, thanks to the infamous Dr. Vegapink, Hina and Bastille told me. While they analyzed various structures and systems of marine platoon and satiated their intelligence, I had a quiet fun with gut style training routine. Hair hair head to the extent that I was currently in a wheelchair, unable to move a single finger. Well ha ha. Gut pointed his finger and laughed at me with tears in his eyes. You look like a moron, brat. This is because of you. Old man I immediately barked. Before slouching back into the wheelchair immediately. All my body is sore. Uh, Bastille, who was holding onto the back of the wheelchair, sweat dropped. It seems that you two are getting along. Boggard, who was standing behind Garp, shook his head as if pitying me. Well, that's enough chit chat. Hina, who was gazing at a front, then stated, Hina thinks we're here. Just when she said so, the noises of horns resounded out from the mist ahead of us. Upon receiving the noises, the lookout of our ship, who was sitting on the crow's nest the topmost section of the ship lifted up the horn, and blew in a certain pattern. Just then, something behind the mist moved, what the Bastille exclaimed in wonder, and I too was at a loss for words. It was a gate. A humongous gate, so huge that I thought a giant was marching at us, slowly opened providing an entry of our ship into the thick walls. That now were visible. Why? Gart grinned upon noticing my antics. Is it your first time looking at the Gate of Justice? Bolgard, who was silently standing at the back, spoke up calmly. We've entered the Tarai current through the Eni's lobby gate. At the current rate, our estimated time of arrival is approximately an hour. Gart carried on, and don't think that the funeral of Nijirizashi is the only thing that's happening there. We've kept it hidden as a huge surprise. But, he placed his arms on his waist, most of the available marines will be gathering from all around the world, and there will be major changes happening three days after. Bastille and I let out the signs of interest curious about how the events will flow. Hina, on the other hand, simply crossed her arms elegantly as if having known Gup's information already. Is that alright though? I couldn't help but question even now. The pirates are crossing the red line and causing harm everywhere, aren't they? And hence, most of the available marines. Gup San explained to you. Bogart explained coolly. Some marines at important duties won't show up. Additionally, the ceremonies on certain occasions are necessary to showcase the might of the marine to everyone, in order to gain the trust of the civilians, and inflict fear on the criminals. For the rest of the time, Garp and Bogard took time in explaining to us the specific details of what to do, and what to be careful of. It seemed that we, as future marine officers, were receiving special treatment not that I was complaining. And one hour swiftly passed by. Once again, the incredibly huge gate of justice opened, and our ship sailed out of the rapid terai current. Moments after, there now lied the fascinating view of Marineford that I got to view through the monitor in my previous life, I was filled with nothing but wonders. So here we are, I muttered while unconsciously standing up from the wheelchair and walking up to the front of the deck, the Marine Headquarter, the island that serves as the base of all Marine Operations Marineford. Oh, Gut raised his eyebrow with a pleasant surprise, better already, eh? I've never seen someone who can actually withstand Gutsen's training. Bogard shook his head in disbelief before asking me, Kid, what do you smoke? What? Smoke. I immediately frowned and turned to Bogard. I smoke nothing, smoke nothing, and will smoke nothing. That's the motto of my life. Behind me, Hina was nodding with her eyes closed, agreeing with my words. On the other hand, Bastille looked at me with a dead pen, and he seemed to be thinking, and your name is Smoker. The huge marine ship that took us all the way from G4 to here, Marineford docked. 
The marine soldiers moved in an orderly fashion, carrying the crates and various supplies out of the ship to elsewhere in the Marineford. The awaiting shipwrights immediately began to inspect the state of the ship, in order to make sure that there is no issue regarding the safety during the sail. Gart was long gone already, saying that he needs to pay a visit to his friend. Bogard, on the other hand, was busy ordering his subordinates. Marineford Bay I noticed as I looked around, along with the plaza over there, where Ace, in the cannon, almost had himself executed on top of. I was simply amazed. My heart thumped rapidly as the ship, which I stood on top of, now sat within this circular Marineford Bay I couldn't help but be mesmerized by the mighty view of the Marine's greatest stronghold. For three days, you will be given the time to familiarize yourselves in Marineford. One Marine soldier stated at Hina, the steel, and me in a friendly manner, the specific details will be given by your colleague here. Next to Bogart stood one teenage girl, raising her hand up lazily, she introduced herself. I'm Dol, a trainee who's partaking in the elite marine officer program like you three. Hina and Bastille nodded simultaneously. Hina is Hina. Nice to meet you, Dol. I'm Bastille Dara. Dol, ugh, hold on. I inwardly frowned trying to think just where I'd seen that name while reading the manga. Uh, yeah, no idea. Then, when I woke up from my thought, I noticed that Dol was staring at me intently. And this distracted idiot here is Smoker. It was only when Hina introduced me for my sake, did I realize what Dol was waiting for. Turning around with a half, she motioned with her hand telling us to follow. Come, I'll introduce you to the others. The four of us, with Dol at the front, were walking across the town. Apart from the initial mightiness that brought me into awe, Marineford surely did possess liveliness, with children running across the streets without any worries, and the civilians watching them with smiles of their own. The majority of Marineford is composed of households for the civilians, Dol explained as we passed through, and all of them are the families of the Marines. Stopping momentarily, Dol turned and looked at us with a shade of sadness on her expression. Surprisingly enough, this place termed Marineford Town wasn't established too long ago. Huh, why though Dara? In contrast to Bastille, who tilted his head in confusion, Hina and I realized what she was speaking of. Holding Marine's own families as hostages, my eyes narrowed. It surely would have been a glaring weakness back then. Seven years ago, Dol continued with her hands in her pockets. One Marine Admiral lost his wife and son due to a pirate who harbored hatred for him. The following result was the heartbroken man who's unable to go through even a single day without nightmares. I listened seriously while watching the peaceful view around us. This not only affected the former Admiral himself, but also every other Marines. After all, if even the hard world Admiral is reduced to such a state, what about the other Marines? What will they do if their loved ones die due to the pirates whom they failed to catch? Dol muttered before turning back and resuming her walk. Therefore, the plan to establish this Marineford town has been issued by none other than the fleet Admiral Kong himself, although I am not sure how he managed to acquire the necessary funds. That Bastille seemed to be shaken. Hina, who exhibited a stern expression, spoke up softly. That was the story of the instructor Zephyr, wasn't it? Dol didn't respond, but her silence was enough of an answer. Continuing to follow Dol, I felt as if I was filled with complex emotions. Should I be happy that I have no family member? That there will be no such risk for me? Sometimes, when I gaze at the stars at night, I would fall into the pit of loneliness, shivering and wondering why I was sent here. Losing your loved ones, or not having any from the start, eh, pick your poison. I felt my fist clenching up unconsciously. Eventually, the four of us arrived in front of what seemed to be a quite huge building. Standing out from the nearby households, this building, rectangular and overall shape, seemed to exhibit cold and harsh traits just by the view alone. And here is where we stay. Dole placed her hand out with palm facing above. The elite marine training facility, built by the personal request of the instructor Zephyr. Just like you three, I only came here around a month ago, but I can tell you with confidence that he is, without a doubt, the best teacher in the whole world. It seemed that wherever I went everyone was boasting and praising how great Zephyr was as a teacher. However, I already am placed under Gup's guidance, and honestly, hearing these words about Zephyr alone, oak me. Honestly, although Gup Sensei's training is undoubtedly tough, the resulting improvement is beyond what one can imagine I huffed as Dol continued to voice her admiration for Zephyr, TCH, Zephyr. Best instructor, I bet that it's nothing but an inflated rumor. I mean, he was called Black Arm Zephyr but lost his arm against Edward Weevil in the future. I didn't get to come across the instructor Zephyr before. Is he really that great as the others say? The steel asked in curiosity. Dol, in response, lifted her chin up and puffed her chest out, proclaiming loudly, definitely, without a doubt, nah. Gup Sensei is the best, without thinking. The words came out of my mouth causing Dol to freeze. Hina and Bastille looked at me weirdly. Hina then whispered to Dol, worry not. He's simply suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Having heard Hina's words, I immediately retorted, no, I'm not. Hina squinted her eyes at me, 
says the one who was throwing all kinds of insults at Vice Admiral Gup just a day ago. Hina amazed. Dol stared at me as if looking at an alien. Never have I seen in my life someone who is insane enough to undertake Vice Admiral Gup's training routine. Scratching her head with a small chuckle, Dol turned around and grabbed the door handle. Creaking it open, she motioned us to enter. We can talk more after. For now, get inside. Inside the building that we could see through the door. 50, 51, 52. One muscular teen was seen to be doing a steady bicep curl for his right arm. Yo, smoker, the steel leaned in and whispered. Did you notice it too? His left arm is bulkier. My eyes narrowed as I commented. I see that he's the man of culture. Walking up to the guy, I spoke up casually. Hey, I'm Smoker. What's yours? The guy looked up at me with his face sweaty from the exercise. Without answering my words, he placed the dumbbell down and wiped the sweat off of his body with a towel, before shouting at Dole. Hey yo, doll. You didn't tell me that the newbies are coming today. You were freaking asleep, Maynard. My initial impression of this guy was rude. Throwing the towel away, Maynard stood up. He was far taller than me, and now that I got a closer look, the beard has started to grow from his chin. He then leaned down on me, and growled, Well, nice to meet you, kid. But know this. In here, I am the best, I am the strongest, and I am your senior. Treat me as if treating a king, hey, as I watch this dude's antics casually. The steel suddenly interrupted the scene. Who do you think you are? Smoker was simply greeting you, wasn't he? Huh? Who the fuck are you? Hina and Dol, who were standing at the back, rolled their eyes simultaneously, boys as always. Maynard, noticing that Bastille was taller than him, took a step back. Is he intimidated by Bastille? I thought. Then, Maynard started posing all of a sudden, you can't compare to me. I've been taught under Zephyr Sensei for a year. And look at all these muscles that I've gained already. Chen N N N G G G P F F. I'm able to conceal my amusement any longer. I exploded in laughter. Ha 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 Maynard fell silent, with his face increasingly getting furious. Wiping the tears from my face, I exclaimed, Ha ha you're really funny. I can't even breathe properly ha 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 Bastille. Looking at me laughing uncontrollably, had his shoulders shaking. Eventually, being unable to suppress his laughter, he began to laugh along with me. Dara 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 oi, you two why are laughing? Why are you laughing? Maynard growled, bumping his fists together, fucking hell. Go eat shit, wimp. He then brashly threw a heavy punch at me who was still laughing. Oh boy, at the back, Dolph Asipund. That smoker boy is done for. Hina refuted with her arms crossed, Hina disagrees. Maynard is someone who already outcompeted some of her seniors. What can that thin boy do against him? Dol turned at Hina with her eyebrow raised. Smoker caught a pirate with a devil fruit ability. Hina continued to speak with certainty. You should pray that smoker doesn't kill that pea-brained fool by accident. Tap. Just when Hina said so, I effortlessly grabbed Maynard's punch without the utilization of my fruit ability, causing Maynard to frown in a confusion. What? Dol's eyes widened in shock. Uh oh, Bastille took a step back, with his laugh stopped. Then, before Maynard could do anything, well, you started it. I blasted my punch onto this huge guy's face, boom causing him to crash through the wall of the building. When the dust was cleared, Maynard was unconscious, with his broken nose bleeding. He and sighed as if having expected this. I stood with my right fist outstretched, shocked by my own strength. Is it that I've become stronger? Or that Maynard is simply too weak. The last time I utilized my strength, the result wasn't as destructive as it currently was. I clearly restricted the use of my fruit ability. I didn't awaken Haki either. Is this truly the result produced by nothing but my physical capability alone? I felt a grin forming on my face. He's the child version of Vice Admiral Gup. Bastille, whose back was touching the wall out of fright, muttered with a pale face, Vice Admiral Gup created a monster just like him, Dara. I chuckled, since when did you grow a sense of humor? Bastille's frightened demeanor immediately disappeared upon my words, with his expression loosening and him chuckling in a similar manner. Dara Dara, you liked it Dara. I find that Dara thing of yours more amusing. Watching as the two of us joked with one another, not concerned with the unconscious Maynard at all, Dol groaned from the back. I can already tell that they are going to be troublesome. Hina nodded solemnly. Back in Logue Town, Smoker was called the 47th Chaos of Logue Town. Now that Hina thinks about it, it may be a good thing that he's under Vice Admiral Gup's care. Then, the loud noises of footsteps were heard from the floor above. It seemed that the ruckus that I caused has reached the ears of the others. Four guys stormed down the stairs with a lope written on their faces. Hey, what's going on? One brawny dude in the front, whose eyes were widened upon sighting the fallen figure of Maynard, shouted, Maynard. Dol exclaimed from the back, that's Akand. Maynard. One dude with the bottom half of his face covered by a white veil, cried in shock, holy hell. I never saw him like this before, like ever. That's Shu, said Dol. Serves you right. I knew this was going to happen one day or another. Another man, who was as huge as Akahant, bickered while looking at the fallen Maynard with disdain. He had a jagged blonde beard, and was wearing a standard marine cap. That's Dalmatian. Just when Dol explained, Hina, the steel, and I saw one boy with slick back blonde hair and sunglasses that covered his eyes, approaching us. Sunglasses indoor. Huh, I thought as the boy stood in front of us with a stoic expression. Dol was about to explain. That's, but was forced to stop as the boy raised his right hand up, motioning Dol to stop. Hold on. I'll introduce myself, Mademoiselle Dol. 
the boy stated before taking out a rose from who knows where. Subsequently, he, all of a sudden, genuflected with his gaze headed at Hina. Hello there, sweetheart. Hina, whose face was pale, immediately took a step back while rubbing her arms, Hina confused. Hina creeped out. Ignoring Hina's remark, the boy took a snuff out of the rose in his hand. I knew from the very start when I sighted you, that we were meant together even now. I feel the thick string of fate tangling as I speak to you. Oh, my destined one, by what name shall I call you? Bastille sweat dropped. Jude, she literally just said it Dara. The boy turned his head at Bastille, glared at him for a millisecond, before turning back at Hina, who was slowly backing away from him. Ah, uh, I see. Hina. Oh. Hina, what a beautiful name. I can't help but think about how well Mademoiselle Hina and my name fit together so well. Leaning down at Doll, I whispered, what is wrong with him? He's been like that ever since Zephyr Sensei gave him the talk Doll said with nothing but annoyance in her tone, TCH. He thinks he's a playboy, simply by putting loads of wax on his hair every day. Mademoiselle, the boy held the rose out at Hina. Please accept my token of love. But all of a sudden, Akahand, who appeared between the boy and Hina, munched on the rose that the boy was holding. Why? I had no idea, perhaps he found it funny. Akahand the boy exploded in fury, thrashing his arms wildly at much bigger Akahand. You wanna have a go? Huh? Akahand, on the other hand, was holding his neck in pain, paying for his stupidity. Oh oh, t this hurts. Because Rose has thorns, Hina said impassively, not bothered by the state that the two were within. So, watching as the scene has fallen into greater chaos, I asked Dole. What's that blonde boy's name? Dole replied with a snort, cancer. Bastille and I stiffened up. What? I asked again, thinking that I heard it wrong. Who in the right mind would name their own child cancer of all possible choices? Says the one whose parents named him Smoker Dash Darrow. Bastille deadpanned at me. Shit, man, I crackled, unable to conceal the laughter. Smoker. Cancer. Dole. What's wrong with our names? Hey, Dole glared at me. Don't include me in your weird name club. But think about it. Your name is Dole. If your surname is something like Cursed, your full name becomes Cursed Dole. Listening to my words seriously. Bastille then widened his eyes in realization. He grabbed me by the shoulder and said with a shaky voice, W which means, if her surname is S-E-X. Fuck off Dole barked at Bastille, with her face now red. She then grabbed me by the collar and shook me wildly. Why did you have to mention that I laughed without a control as I was flopping up and down due to Dole? Oh, hi there, sex Dole for ha 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 oh, Princess Hina. Please accept my confession, Hina declines. Someone pluck out the thorns for me, they are stuck in my neck. Here lies Maynard, 15 years old. He lived a worthless life and died a worthless death. Now, we will the situation surely has gotten out of control, not that I, who was occupied with the angry doll, cared, creak until what is going on here. One huge man with spiky purple hair, even taller than Garp, entered the building, causing all of us to fall silent instantly, except for Akahand, who was still coughing from the pain. The atmosphere within the room suddenly shifted. Gone was the chaotic madness, and with everyone having calmed down, we couldn't help but feel a little embarrassed. Zephyr, the main antagonist of One Piece film, bed. While the goofiness in me diminished, I gazed the purple-headed figure. He already lost his family, but hasn't reached the point of losing his entire division. I knew that he was inherently a good man. Perhaps I was going too far to think this way but I couldn't help but wonder if I will be able to prevent such a future. Walking past all of us, the Zephyr looked at the still unconscious Maynard and crouched down in front of him. I expected something like this to happen one day. Take this humbling experience as a grain of salt, Maynard. He commented before standing back up and shifting his eyes to the destroyed wall next to Maynard. Massaging his temple with an evident exhaustion written on his face, he turned at Akahand and ordered, go take Maynard to the clinic and get your neck treated as well. Akahand, who was sweating profusely from fear, nodded and moved hurriedly, lifting Maynard up and running out of the building. Then, Zephyr turned and walked at us. So, Zephyr spoke in a gruff voice. Who among you injured Maynard? Zephyr really was an interesting person. If Gart were to be in his place right now, he would have punched every single one of us here. While laughing at the pitiful state that Maynard was in, the fact that Zephyr maintained his calm and thoroughly assessed the situation seemed to suggest me that he was intellectual and mature. Without any hesitation, I stepped up, I did. If he's the same Zephyr that I've seen in the movie, he would probably think that harming your own colleague is not excusable by any means. Therefore, I directly looked him in the eye while standing strictly and said, and I am well aware that I've gone against the marine code at this moment. Sir, I will personally take my time later on to apologize to Maynard as well as take any reasonable punishment that you issue. What's your name, kid? Zephyr finally asked, without expressing any emotion in particular. Smoker, sir. Zephyr's eyes narrowed upon hearing my name. Eventually, he sighed while turning around. I am not sure what exactly happened here, but children's feuds are meant to be resolved among themselves. I'll let it go this time around, but treat your colleagues with respect and don't destroy anything next time around. What a generosity I couldn't help but remark. Walking to a nearby chair and sitting down, Zephyr faced us once again. Leaning forward, he looked at all of us and stated, If you aren't aware of, I am Zephyr, the head instructor of this training facility. You may call me Instructor Zephyr or Zephyr Sensei, starting from today, Chore Boys Hina and Bastille, 
are to return to the unregistered rank of trainee, while Chore Boy Smoker will temporarily be placed under my charge for three days until the grand ceremony is over. Pausing momentarily to check the facial expressions of Behina, Bastille, and me, Zephyr continued, although there is no particular schedule for the next three days, and you are free to roam around outside, know that I'm responsible for any trouble you make. Behave well and don't cause any trouble. The three of us said at loud voice, yes sir. Standing back up, Zephyr said while walking away, the rest of you, help these three to clean up this room and show them where to sleep. Yes, Zephyr Sensei. Dol, Shu, Dalmatian, and Cancer answered at once as Zephyr exited the room, closing the door behind him. After cleaning up the mess, we were introduced to simplistic dormitories, one for guys and another for girls. Subsequently, we were shown the public restaurant and the health centers which were all accessible for free to the Marines and their family members. Surprisingly enough, only six of them, eight including Hina and Bastille, were currently under Zephyr's guidance. It seemed that the normal Marine soldiers, as well as the other potential Marine officer wannabes like me, were to be trained apart from these eight. And just like that, the day was over. Currently lying on one of the beds that sat in the male dormitory, with the rest of the boys snoring loudly, I gazed at the window outside, which displayed the Marine food that was illuminated by the bright moon. Even at night, there are a high number of Marines patrolling around. I suppose that being in proximity to their own families, too, serve as a great motivation for their duties. Then, I sighted one Marine officer with black afro hair, walking with one blonde teen on his side. Sengoku, and my eyes widened Rosanante, yet another individual who's got a sad end awaiting for him in the future. The man who didn't fall into darkness even after going through all sorts of traumatic events, and sacrificed his life for one young boy's future am I a nosy person? Am I naive? Leaning away from the window, I smiled with a snort, why is it that every time I come across people like them? I think of a way to save them. But you know what? I don't care if I'm being idiotic right now. Even if it may seem childish to think of saving the Anime characters who don't even know me. Now, they are breathing in front of me, alive. Anime is no longer a mere entertainment, but a future knowledge that I can and will actively use to gain the advantages. Therefore, I can and will save them, period. Besides, what's wrong with saving the good people who are in need of help? I was a Marine, after all. Three days later forward, on the third day since my arrival at Marineford, the majestic view was unveiled before my eyes, where the incredible number of Marines simultaneously marched forth under the command of Marine Warren Officer, whose name was unknown to me. I, along with my colleagues, Bastille, Dol, Maynard, Akahan, Shu, Dalmatian, and Cancer, were watching the introductory phase of the grand ceremony from the roof of the same training facility three days ago. The service of those whose ranks were chore boy or below, weren't needed in this ceremony. The only exception was Hina, who was currently standing ahead of all those marine soldiers, and right behind the marine warrant officer, wearing all black attire. In her hands were flowers of unknown identity, clenched tight. Full of emotion, she seemed to be crying silently. Between Hina and numerous marine soldiers, there was one coffin, held by six marine soldiers. What a triumphant march it was. I never expected such a grand gathering of marines, and the feeling of mightiness that this march seemed to be conveying, surely reached me. Wah, the steel, who seemed to be feeling the same as me, whispered behind his usual metal mask. Doll, whose eyes were headed at me, chuckled before pointing her finger out. Do you see that Den Den Mushi over there? Following Doll's finger, I came to sight the Den Den Mushi, whose body was colored yellow, opening its eyes wide while gazing the march from above. I then noticed that such Den Den Mushi was held by one nimble-looking marine officer, who moved around from building to building like a ninja recording the scene. That's Kimeko. Kimeko records the video and transmits it to Proko, who probably is in Sabadi Archipelago at the current moment TCH. Shut up for a second, Doll. Dol's explanation was cut off by Dalmatian, who frowned in annoyance. Dol, looking at me, simply shrugged while giving the middle finger at Dalmatian, before shifting her eyes back at the ceremony. Following her suit, I saw that the march has finally come to an end. On the sides, the marine officers, ranging all the way from ensign to vice admirals, were standing strictly with their justice coats on. With the marine warrant officer moving to the side, Ina walked along with the six coffin holding marines behind her, through the gap bet when the marine officers, those whom Hina passed by bowed in a respectful way, sending away one of the renowned marine. Within the line of vice admirals, my eyes stopped upon locating the particular man whose face seemed to be in a default frown. He wore a standard marine cap and a plain hoodie over it, although he stood with the other vice admirals. He, in my sight, stood out from the rest giving off the intensive vibe that I couldn't explain. That's Vice Admiral Sakazuki, codename Akainu, Red Dog, Doll. Noticing my attention on that man, whispered. Eager to explain, she looked at Dalmatian warily for a second before beginning her explanation. Vice Admiral is the rank known to be right below Admiral, right? There are two main qualifications that are required of the Vice Admirals to be approved as the potential Admiral candidates. Strength and leadership. Strength is astutely judged by that Vice Admiral's feats, while the leadership is spoken by the voices of other Marines, who have spent a good amount of time with the candidate. 
code name is only granted to the admirals, and possession of it serves as the proof that one deserves the title of an admiral. Dole paused momentarily to take a breath before continuing. Currently, there are three admiral candidates. Vice Admiral Hanazumi, code name Heronazumi, Grey Rat, Vice Admiral Sakazuki whom you currently are looking at, and Vice Admiral Borsalino, code name Kazaru, Yellow Monkey. Thanks to this system, even if one admiral were to leave the service, the seat can immediately be filled with another. Heronazumi, Dole pointed her finger at one man, who had a very long grey-coloured beard and a shiny bald head. He, in my eyes, looked like Genesai Shijikuni, uh, whoever he was from the Anime named Bleach. Past those admiral candidates, at the end of two lines of the marine officers, there stood two most renowned marine vice admirals. Monkey D got the marine hero and Tsuru the great advisor. With justice coats draped over them, they looked at the coffin solemnly. Walking past them, Hina and six coffin holding marines began to climb up the staircase that lied at the end, leading to the higher platform. And there, I saw the current three admirals, slightly bowing their head as the coffin behind Hina passed by them. Don't tell me that you don't know the infamous three admirals. Dole, noticing my gaze on her, said with a disbelief. But still, having heard Dole's whisper, turned and whispered at me with shocked demeanor. What? You don't even know the current admirals. Damn, that sucks. Well, I know one Admiral Sengoku over there. I shrugged, causing Dole to shake her head with a fake disappointment. Then let me tell you, the three strongest marine officers of the current time. I found it quite funny. Dole tried to act cool. But it was evident just how she was yearning to talk about this. I wondered if she was a fangirl for all the marine-related stuffs. The first and foremost Admiral Blaze, codenamed Cedar Heavy, Bronze Snake. Following where her eyes were headed at, I looked at the seemingly middle-aged man with long orange-colored hair and brown-colored eyes. If I were to summarize him in one word Dark Horse. Dole whispered with an evident blush on her cheeks. He only joined the marine around five years ago, and climbed all the way to Admiral within such a short time. Besides, her lips trembled as if she was unable to conceal her excitement. He managed to make the devil fruit that everyone believed it to be underwhelming into an incredible one. I raised my eyebrow. What can it be? The jacket jacket fruit. In a complete shock, I found my jaw dropping. No way. I couldn't help but mutter, to which Bastille too nodded while patting my back. That's what I too thought at the start. Anyway, Bastille then pointed at another admiral who stood above another. Why don't you look at her? It was the only female admiral. Tall and stoic, yet there existed a sense of elegance. Although the wrinkles on her face indicated that she was quite old-aged, her vibrant blue-colored eyes and gray hair suggested that she was a beautiful one at young age. Admiral Anastasia, codenamed Ginkiji, Silver Pheasant, Dole stated with her fists clenched she, along with Vice Admiral Tsuru, is an idol to all female marines like me. Coupled with the strength amplified by her iron iron fruit, she is invincible. It's loja type, just saying. The steel muttered from the side. So cool now that I looked at all the other boys here with me, seemed to be staring at her in awe. Jeez, I couldn't help but think with an inward laugh. And finally, we have Admiral Sengoku the Buddha code named Kinyagi, Golden Goat, ah uh, thanks, but, I interrupted Dole. I know him already. No need. Dole, who grew a tick mark on her forehead, nonetheless continued, if Vice Admiral Gup mainly chased after the Pirate King, Admiral Sengoku was the antithesis of none other than Whitebeard, the strongest man in the world. That alone is enough to show just how strong Admiral Sengoku is. I see that he hasn't become the fleet admiral yet I thought as Hina, with six coffin holding marines behind her, now reached the top of the staircase, where the current fleet admiral of the marine, Kong, was standing. The six marines moved ahead of Hina, and placed the coffin down between Hina and Kong, before silently standing by the side. Subsequently, Hina placed the flowers in her hands down, before moving to the side as well. Finally, Kong has begun to speak. Here lies Vice Admiral Najirazashi, the righteous man who served in the Marine for the past 43 years. His firm belief in justice was firmer than anyone else, and his virtues knew no bound. Mighty and brave, he caught countless pirates and rescued countless civilians. I express nothing but grief that we have to send away such a formidable Marine. Nonetheless, we, the Marine as a whole, sincerely hope that he will rest in peace, now that he reached the resolution to his commendable life. Once again, may you rest in peace, my friend Najirazashi. Then, the sounds of trumpets were heard, as the six marines lifted the coffin back up and walked beyond the fleet Admiral Kong, with Hina following from the behind. They will now head to the marine cemetery, which is located at the edge of the marineford. When the trumpets stopped playing, the whole area was filled with silence. Kong, with his eyes closed, stood still, as if grieving over the death of Hina's grandfather. Then, his eyes opened. Subsequently, his mouth too opened, and he stated, and as the conclusion of Vice Admiral Najirazashi's funeral has been reached, I would now like to make a major announcement. All Marines looked at Kong with their body still. My friends and I who still are at the roof of the training facility, watch the scene in anticipation, afraid to let out the sound of breathing even. With the death of the Pirate King, the new era has risen. I too have grown old, and I recently felt my sense of judgment failing I believe that my time to retire has come. The flower that fully bloomed now awaits for nothing but death, and it is the seed born from it that replaces its place. The steel, doll, and all others around me, gasped in a shock. What a shrewd man Kong is. 
He speaks as if he is withered, but after retiring from the position of the Fleet Admiral, he becomes the Commander-in-Chief of the World Government, the position that stands higher than the Fleet Admiral in some people's perspectives I thought, while gazing at Kong with narrowed eyes. But regardless, if this is the case, then the next Fleet Admiral is. Starting from today, I officially step down from the seat of the Fleet Admiral, Kong declared in a firm tone, and such title will now be entrusted to the remarkable Marine Admiral Sengoku. I currently was witnessing one of the One Piece world's biggest event. Within the absolute silence, many Marines' jaws were opened wide. With a stern expression on his face, Kong stated, Admiral Sengoku, step up. Sengoku stoically turned around, stepped up to the higher platform, and stood next to Kong. The Admiral candidates and admirals are bestowed with the special code names, consisting of a unique color, and one among the following 12 animals. Rat, Bull, Tiger, Rabbit, Dragon, Snake, Horse, Goat, Monkey, Pheasant, Dog, and Pig. Kong said while taking one exquisite looking badge off of his justice coat and starting today. The code name of Kinyagi is abolished. Instead, there will be Fleet Admiral Sengoku, who will lead the Marine into a bright future. Walking closer to Sengoku, who stood still while facing the front strictly, Kong placed the badge the symbol of Fleet Admiral on the former's justice coat. Kong's announcement was then followed by Sengoku's charismatic speech, the applause from the Empower Marines, the promotion of Vice Admiral Heron Azumi to the rank of an Admiral, and the occurring party afterward in order to celebrate this incredible news. Someone bring more beer, we are going to be back at work starting tomorrow shit. Enjoy while it lasts. Would you like to dance with me? My colleagues too were involved in this mess of a party, drinking carefree and dancing like madmen. But apart from the joys that were shared among the Marines, this event placed me under many thoughts as well. Now that I recall, Sitting down on the chair next to one set-up table, with an orange juice next to me, I thought with my eyes gazing at the drunk disciples of Zephyr, Smoker and the Cannon, had a technique named White Snake. Is that the foreshadowing of his codename? Sure a heavy will that also be my codename, if I were to attain the title of Admiral. Then there's the matter of seven warlords I tap my fingers against the table, two most prominent concerns among the seven are Crocodile and Doflamingo, who will scheme against an entire nation. In contrast, Hancock becomes warlord to protect her island, Moria dwells in the Florian Triangle, Mihik doesn't actively commit evil, and Jim and Kuma are inherently good in nature at least in my opinion. Considering that the reputations of the powerhouses in the new world are becoming more and more widespread, Spread. It is only a matter of time before the world government issues the establishment of seven warlords to balance the power of the world. Problem is, once Crocodile and Doflamingo become warlords, stopping their plots becomes much trickier. This means that if I truly want to prevent the calamities that will befall upon the civilians, I must stop them before the seven warlord system begins. Time is the key. The lesser amount of time it takes for me to reach an adequate level of strength, the more I will be able to save. In order to do that, I must not only train vigorously, but also efficiently. And the first step is to really understand the full scope of what my fruit ability is capable of doing. Shifting my eyes, I looked at a campfire nearby, where numerous people gathered around and baked marshmallows. The campfire utilized the wet woods. In order to light up the flame, numerous attempts were made, however, only the smoke was produced. There was one particular observation that I was able to make during such a process. White smoke. They were technically formed of water vapors that evaporated from the wet woods. I initially believed that such a concept overlaps with that of a steam, but within the canon, there was a scene where Smoker clashed against Porker's D. Ace, and in contrast to what my smoke did back in G4, Smoker and Cannon managed to go in par against Ace's flame. White smoke, white of the color, the more water vapor the smoke contains. Thinking deeply, I now remembered the smoke that I thoughtlessly produced back in G4 had a grayish color. Burnt particles, I was thinking of them as I generated the smoke, and the result was exactly what I imagined. Which means, the smoke of pure white color is not inflammable I speculated with some degree of certainty, while the dark colored smoke combusts easily. The world of One Piece is full of water. The sunlight tends to evaporate the surface of the ocean, and if such evaporated water particles were to belong within the scope of smoke, then it explains why Smoker's smoke didn't combust against Ace's flame. He was too used to using only the smoke constituted out of water, and did the same in the water scarce alabaster. This meant one thing, I could develop an entirely new set of skills using smoke smoke fruit distinct from the abilities of white smoke that the cannon smoker showcased. There, it finally feels like I'm going somewhere. What are you doing here, alone? My thought was interrupted by a voice, waking me up. Looking at where the voice came from, I saw Hina, who was out of her former all black attire. Hina didn't know Smoker was a shy guy. My expression softened upon sighting Hina. I asked her who took a seat next to me. Did you send a good farewell message to your grandfather? Yes, indeed, Hina nodded with a nostalgic smile. Hina spoke until there was nothing left to say. Death. Leaving this world taking a set from the orange juice. I thought as the two of us fell into silence, do I fear death? I couldn't help but think while remembering the coffin of Hina's grandfather. I can't remember myself before the transmigration well. In contrast, many memories regarding One Piece are very clear in my head. Perhaps, before the transmigration happened, I died in my previous world. Survival, was the fear of death the reason why I was so desperate to survive upon my arrival in this world? No, with some time having passed, 
I can say with confidence, what I didn't fear was death I feared, and still do fear, dying a meaningless death. So, breaking the silence, Hina asked, when are you heading out? Reaching her hand to a waiter who was walking by, Hina snatched a cup of grape juice before gulping it down. Watching her antics with amusement, I replied, tomorrow, right away. What? That soon, Hina remarked with a frown on her face, before pausing in realization, but Hina supposed that's expected of Vice Admiral Garp Harwai. Are you that depressed to be separated from me? I said jokingly, trying to ease the mood, but in contrast to my expectation, Hina lowered her head with sadness in her eyes. Hey, what's wrong? Grabbing her by the chin and lifting her face up, I grinned, it's only going to be a little while, right? No need to be so sad over it. E, get your hand off Hina. Blushing due to embarrassment, Hina slapped my hand away and turned her head away from me. I, you know, when Hina first met you back in Logue Town, Hina thought you were a hopeless guy, beating up everyone on your left and right. And that turned out to be true. And, and, and what? I asked with my lips twitching, struggling not to burst out a laugh. And you need someone to take care of you. Hina was with you until now. But now that you will be with Vice Admiral Garp, Hina can only fear what you may become in the future. Well, I will become Jack for sure. I said while flexing my right arm, before widening my eyes at my bicep. Oh, I already am to some extent. Shem PH? Hina crossed her arms and snorted as if Hina cares. And this is who you are, Hina I chuckled while watching Hina's antics, you try to act strong and mature being strict in all circumstances. But once such a facade is broken, you tend to become quite emotional, quite cute, I'd say. Being a marine gave me a sense of belonging. I now had a teacher to rely on, and friends whom I can entrust my back to. I do admit, that I currently was in a great mood, unable to believe that I managed to adapt to this world so well. But it is also true that the marine has a dark side. In the future, if the situation where I need to make a decision between friends and righteousness is to come by, what choice will I make? You know, Hina, I'm not going to say a goodbye. I spoke with a certainty. Because we are going to meet again in the future, higher up in the ladder, right? Hina supposed so. Hey, Brad, did you say goodbye to your friends? Early in the morning, Garp, whose huge hands were on his waist, asked me with a grin on his face. The day of the grand ceremony has already become yesterday, and the time for me to depart from Marineford has already arrived. All my colleagues probably are sleeping noisily right now, with those snot bubbles inflating and deflating repeatedly giving the Marineford one final look. I turned at Garp and similarly grinned. No need to say goodbye. I replied while taking out two lollipops from my pocket, because we'll be meeting again soon anyway. Well ha ha, good answer. As Garp laughed, I took off the wrappers from the candies, and plopped both of them into my mouth. Many things happened since I came here. There were ups and downs, and there certainly were desperate moments. However, let's place all my concerns down now. What comes first well, starting from now on, I said while holding my right hand out at Garp. I will be under your care, Vice Admiral Garp. Hey, you bet, is to get stronger. Garp then slapped his hand on top of mine, ah, uh, dash causing me to scream at my lungs due to the sheer shock of it, with my right hand now swollen. Wahahaha, set sail. Yes, sir. And just like that, I've begun my very own journey in one piece, walking down a different path than the cannon smoker. 1501, one year after in the middle of the wild sea, within the storm where the thunders roared and winds blew wildly, there was one brightly lightened ship in the middle, with the Jolly Roger engraved on its sail. Enduring the harsh weather, such pirate ship advanced through the Grand Line, filled with joy and wonder. The pirates sang and danced. Some swung their weapons wildly, completely drunk. yo a ho ho yo a ho ho It was one hell of a party, and the pirates didn't even seem to care if they were engulfed by the storm or not. Dance, sing, drink, drink as much as you want holding the steering wheel. The man wearing the hat of a pirate captain shouted jovially, completely disregarding the storm, everything is within our grasp. Money freedom and he, with his cheeks pink due to the heavy consumption of alcohol, licked his lips while shifting his eyes at the women tied and immobilized nearby, who were trembling from the cold and fear. Some had their eyes closed tight, filled with nothing but helplessness. Women kehehe here. Now, the only thing that we are missing is none other than the legendary One Piece grinning widely, and revealing his missing teeth, the pirate captain of the crew expressed his contentment. Boys who are we? Upon the captain's shout, all pirates answered loudly, the Grimhut pirates. That's right, we are the Grimhut pirates, destined to become the ruler of the world boom. What was that? In midst of his speech, the captain stopped his words, due to an unidentified thing suddenly coming and flying from who knows where, before crashing onto the ship. With his grin faltered, the captain turned back, and saw a huge hole that broke through the deck of the ship, much to his horror. E-A-H-H-H-H, my ship. The captain screamed with his eyes popped out comically, totally not bothered by the fact that few of his crew members fell off the ship, due to the sudden force. Ugh then, a groan was heard within the dust below the hole on the deck. Gart Sensei is extreme as always. I swear then, through the dust, one shadow shot up. Now, the pirates saw one teenage boy, wearing a standard marine uniform, 
hovering up in the air with an exhausted expression on his face, and a standard marine cap on his right hand. Tap. Landing on the deck, this boy had a spiky white hair, and the hazel-colored eyes that gleamed brilliantly. Placing the standard marine cap on his head, this 13-year-old marine, smoker, now stood relaxed while being surrounded by the entirety of the furious pirates. Marine. There's a marine ship nearby. One pirate shouted in panic before looking all around. However, there was nothing but the ongoing storm around their ship. Where? Who cares? The captain of the crew, who was now holding onto a cutlass, screamed madly while pointing the weapon at Smoker. He's just one marine, and we are literally hundreds in number kill him. Ra Smoker watched in a relaxed position, as the pirates all around him ran with their respective weapons. Hundreds. Now that's not fair, Smoker chuckled just as the sharp looking axe was right above his head for someone of your caliber, even thousands won't be enough. This fight isn't fair for y'all. At the last moment, Smoker leaned in at the pirate holding the axe, such that the wooden belly of the axe hit his right shoulder, and its blade cut across the empty air. Puck. Immediately after, the pirate with axe was instantly knocked by a fast punch from Smoker, which seemed so fast that the surrounding pirates couldn't even properly see. Swoosh. Ducking his head, Smoker dodged a sword that slashed above his head, horizontally. Placing his hand on the wooden deck, Smoker then kicked the chin of the sword holding pirate, causing the latter to choke as his eyes hollowed out. A attack him at the same time one pirate shouted. The four multiple pirates all ran at Smoker simultaneously, stabbing, hacking, and swinging their weapons wildly. However, none of them hit him, and instead, Smoker dodged all of them with ease, while making the bare minimum of movements. Puck 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 puck. Then, all those pirates within Smoker's range, were efficiently knocked out by the quick jabs aimed at their faces. Ugly what is this monster? One pirate muttered fearfully as the cutlass in his grip trembled. He took a step back while gulping, unable to believe that so many fell without even managing to deal a single blow to the teenage marine. The others seemed to be thinking the same, although there were hundreds in number. The feats that Smoker showcased were simply too much those movements didn't belong to an average human, they thought. You stupid dumb fucks. The captain of the crew screamed madly, before pushing the pirates in his front away. Move out of my way in his hands was a Gatling gun, which he aimed at Smoker. Smoker, unfazed by the sight of the firearm, looked at the back of the pirate captain with narrowed eyes, where the civilian women who were looking at him with shock were tied around. Move away. One woman then shouted out of worry. Just as Ryo the pirate captain fired the Gatling gun at Smoker, die 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 her. However, to everyone's shock, the bullets simply phased through Smoker's body, and instead of the blood, what they saw were the wisp of smoke that arose from him. The deck that lie behind Smoker suffered instead, having been completely obliterated. Thud. One pirate mumbled while falling on his butt D devil fruit shit. I got a little distracted, ignorant of his surrounding. Smoker scratched the back of his head while sweating nervously. Gut Sensei told me not to use my fruit ability. I'm fucked, what is wrong with you? The pirate captain, terrified by Smoker's existence, screamed at his lungs. With trembling eyes, he then forcibly grinned once again, about to point his Gatling gun at the civilian women. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. But found Smoker's hand holding onto his wrist all of a sudden, when Smoker hasn't moved from his spot. That's right. His hand, going against the common sense, stretched out all the way to where the pirate captain was standing, with the puffs of smoke connecting between his detached hand and arm. Since I used my fruit ability already, might as well continue using it. Ah. Just as the pirate captain lost the grip over the Gatling gun and fell to his knees, due to the crushing grip that Smoker's hand had over his wrist wide out, the incredible volume of smoke rushed out of Smoker, engulfing the whole ship in one go. Within an instant, the hundreds of pirates, including the pirate captain, were caught under the strong grip of the smoke smoke fruit. MMFFF. MMFFFF with all pirates muffled and undergoing suffocation, Smoker took out a baby Den Den Mushy from his chest pocket and muttered into it. Situation clear. Hostile subdued and hostages rescued Smoker flinched due to a loud shout that rang from the baby Den Den Mushy. I'm sorry, alright? I had no choice. Smoker groaned with his body slumped from depression. Fuck. Shen N N N G G G G. Listen, brat, I'm going to be straight here. Under the blue sky, away from the previous storm, Smoker was busy doing the endless series of push-ups with two huge dumbbells above him. One huge boulder from who knows where above the dumbbells, and garp above the boulder, munching onto the rice crackers. The marine ship in which they were on top of, had a thick rope connected to the large pirate ship, that belonged to the subdued Grimhot pirates. The civilian women moved to the marine ship, quietly sitting on one side with their minds now in ease. 500 UG 9, you've improved a lot in the past year. Garp said with his mouth full of rice cracker, but that's still far from enough. When I was your age, I was already lifting up an entire marine ship for fun. The marine soldiers, who stood on the site, sweat dropped, your standard is simply out of this world, Vice Admiral Gup for an entire year. They watched just what kind of devilish training methods Gup placed Smoker under. 1. 
survivor's gulps punching bag. 2. Climb up to the moving ship from one dangling rope tied at the end of it, in the middle of the ocean when Smoker was a devil fruit user, and could only move when he happened to bounce out of the water by a stroke of luck. 3. Survive in the Sea King's stomach for a week. 4. Survive being thrown by gulp like a cannonball to the middle of the pirate ship. 5. Punch 100,000 times for each fist every day. There simply was no stop to how cruel gulp's training could get, and the marine soldiers were amazed every time they saw Smoker who didn't let out a single complaint during those training sessions. However, hmm, I suppose that a little reward is fine. Sitting up on the boulder and crossing his arms thoughtfully, Gup stated, since regardless of the progress, you are doing your best. Rehuff reward. Smoker, while breathing heavily, said in glee, which half won? More training. Wahahaha Smoker's expression darkened, and the marine soldiers couldn't help but feel sympathy for the teen. Gup, ignoring the antics of those around him, thought with a grin, but it won't be just your everyday type of training. It will consist of the unique set of training methods, which I believe that you now are ready for it. Smoker's body trembled so much from the stress, that the dumbbells and boulder below Gup, began to sway unsteadily. The marine soldiers nearby gulped nervously while taking few steps back. The Rock Yashiki, six powers. Within each marine ship, various eternal poses are situated in order to allow the marines to navigate to the nearest marine base under certain circumstances, such as capturing the pirates. There, the captured pirates and victims of piracy are to be handed over to the base. Subsequently, the base will contact Marineford to move the criminals to the infamous prison in Pell Down, while sending the victims back to their hometowns along with a small amount of compensation. And it was no different for us, who were finally relieved of the burden of carrying around the huge pirate ship. Take care Vice Admiral Garp. Garp gave a thumbs up to the Marines. Hey, I wish you the same. Thank you for saving us, Marine boy. I grinned upon hearing the shouts from those women whom I saved anytime, without any stall. We swiftly left the Marine Base G3, back to the sea, for the purpose of patrolling around the area under Gup's responsibility. By the time we were back on the sea, the sun has already set, and through a small hole between the thick layer of clouds, the moon has begun its role to lighten up the dark night. The sea was calm and gentle, giving us the peace to take a nice rest and recuperate for the time being. Half of the Marine soldiers stood on their guard and looked out for potential threats. The other half slept free of any concern, thanks to the hard work of their colleagues. At 3 a.m., the sleeping half including me were to wake up and replace the lookouts, granting the previous half the time to take proper rest. As for Garp, Ed Z Z Z Z Z Z Z he was snoring loudly in his room, free from these duties. Yawning with my eyes still half-lidded due to the remaining fatigue, I stared off at the dark sea as I stood next to my fellow marines, who occasionally ruffled my head in an encouraging fashion. Time was continuously moving without a stop. Eventually, the moon slowly moved to the edge of the horizon and the sun rose yet again from the other side, signaling that another day has arrived. Food and just as always, the day of our ship began with Garp shouting the word food causing the rest of us to shake our heads in amusement. Garp, who quickly came back to his senses, would then walk up to the deck and greet us, Good morning, you folks. Good morning, Vice Admiral Garp. Or oh, is everything going fine? Indeed, it is. One man with the base suit and hat boggard would always answer Garp's question in such a manner. Although he, in terms of rank, is equal to Garp, he remained as Garp's right-hand man up until now, saying that Garp's side is where he belongs. I didn't mention him until now, you say. He suddenly popped out of nowhere. Well, he doesn't talk much, you know. Good. And just as how Boggard respected Garp, Garp trusted no one more than Boggard. If Boggard said that everything is alright, then it was. Turning my head slightly to look at the other still marine soldiers, I found a small smile forming on my face. Harry, Percy, Gandalf, and many more I've got to know all these soldiers, who were filled with courage and loyalty to Garp. They were fun, lively, and passionate, truly wonderful fellows to get to know, I thought. Train, catch pirates, bond with others, rest and restore, repeat. Although I've spent my past year in such a simplistic routine, it was without any regret. Or, brat, you see that island? Garp, who was now grinning at me, pointed a finger at a distant island that seemed to be empty. I squinted my eyes trying to get a good look at it. I think we've come across that one around a month ago, didn't we? The island was hard and rocky, lacking any trace of life. There was nothing of value on here. I decided just now, that that place is going to be your training ground. Garp said while lifting me by the hem of my uniform, the so-called more training of yours. I see, I remarked with a blank expression, or haha, correct. To which Garp laughed off before throwing me at the island. A-A-H-H-H-H smoke of the marine soldiers, who were terrified by how I was being flown to the rocky island, screamed in panic. Garp simply picked his ear with annoyance written on his face. Hey, what are you so worried about? Just when Garp said so, puff, my body exploded into puffs of smoke upon colliding against the rocky island, there was not even the slightest sign of damage on the rocky ground. Subsequently, my body reformed from the spread out smokes completely fine. The marine soldiers, seeing that I was fine, let out a sigh of relief. From behind them, Boggart simply leaned against the wooden pole, with his hat covering his eyes now. You know why I don't bother mentioning him. I'm going to play around with that brat for a while. So do what you guys have to do. Wahaha. Garp, laughing boisterously, jumped off the ship and casually began his run in the air, although there was nothing to step on. Hum. 
Watching as Gart travel toward me, I place my hand on my chin thoughtfully. What sort of devilish training is he going to impose on me this time? Boom. Then, landing right in front of me at the next moment, Garp, ZZZ, suddenly fell asleep on spot, still standing. I sweat dropped, saying, typical Garp sensei. Gar. Garp, jolting awake immediately after, looked at an empty space with a dumbfounded expression. Oh, I fell asleep. What dream was it about? I asked out of curiosity. It was a nightmare. Sakazuki was munching on a delicious looking donut. Garp said while smacking his lips, before punching me on the head, that's not the point Al. As I rubbed the swollen lump on my head, Garp crossed his arms and began to explain seriously, anyway, I've chosen this remote location today, since the training may destroy my ship by accident. With your physical prowess having reached the level of the dust on my pinky toenail, it's time that you familiarize yourself with the simple yet effective techniques that are widely used among the marine officers and Cifopol agents this is. I was inwardly agitated upon hearing Garp's words, having realized what those techniques are right away. The Rock Yashiki. Garp then raised up his index finger and stated, but before we start, listen. Apparently, there is this one little boy who recently managed to master all Rock Yashiki techniques within six months. I think his name was A. Rob Gucci. Garp struggled to remember the name, but to no avail. Eventually, he just continued. But anyway, considering that even the younger aged kids are taught these, why do you think I stalled up until now? Why not teach you sooner, when you already had a tiny bit of strength a year ago? I shrugged, because you didn't want to. Well ha ha, you aren't wrong there. Gart laughed, before calming himself down and explaining, but the correct answer was, that there is no specific way to train Rakushikus. By the essence, the way of learning and mastering them is achieved by strengthening yourself with physical exercises, which is no different than what you've been doing for the past year. Gart then ordered, try clenching your muscles tight, complying with Gart's words. I lowered my stance and hardened my muscles as much as possible. Then, appearing in front of me, Gup slammed down his right fist on my shoulder, causing me to crash into the ground boom. And truthfully, there was nothing special about the experience. I've always been clenching my muscles every single time I served as Gup's punching bag hold on. My eyes widened in realization as I wobbly stood back up. Are you saying that what I began to do starting a month ago, that simple clenching of muscles to reduce the pain of Gup Sensei's punches, was Tekai? Do you see it now, brat? Garp said with a grin, Rakushikus are nothing but the techniques that follow. As long as your physical capability reaches a sufficient level, the clenching of muscle that you performed just now was none other than Tekai, Iron Body. In the end, no matter how skilled and dexterous you are, it is the brute strength that decides your limit. Garp pointed his finger at my hands, finger base push-ups. Climbing up a cliff with your hands alone, breaking a metal ball with your hands alone your fingers have become as hard as bullets, suitable for Shigen. He then moved his finger at my legs, Hardcore runs, enduring weights, along with countless other exercises. Your legs are now able to handle extreme stress. Kick the ground 10 times to perform Soru. Kick the air as hard as possible to perform Geppo. Kick the air as fast as possible to perform Rankyaku. I found myself amazed. Rakushikus they were the techniques that I have completely forgotten until recently, due to my busy schedule of never-ending physical exercises. And now, here I was, already having the capability to use most of them without trouble. Kick 10 times? Huh? Out of curiosity. I gazed down at my legs, before, swoosh, covering a good deal of distance in an instant, by kicking off the ground ten times just as Gup said, what I did just now, although unrefined, was none other than Soru. And finally, there are your battle experiences. Gup stated while huffing, ahem, why do you believe that I've told you to fight without the use of your devil fruit ability? Because the over-reliance on devil fruit will hinder my growth. However, I said astutely, judging by the nuance of your saying, I believe that it's about the final Rock Yashiki technique that you didn't mention yet. Of course, I knew that it was Kami-e, but I couldn't afford to say it out loud when Garp hasn't given the explanation yet. The information regarding my transmigration was meant to be kept secret under all circumstances, no matter what. Garp nodded, indeed, it was to train you in the aspect of the last of the Rakushikis, known as Kami-e. This technique relies on the user's flexibility, instinct, and experience. There was no more ideal option than to have you thrown into the middle of the pirate ship. Listening to Garp carefully, I nodded in understanding, facing multiple attacks at all angles, yet managing to slip through them without observation haki. The improvement of my body, physical-wise, had me instinctively develop my way of dodging. That could be considered kami -e. With a serious expression on my face, I leaned down while staring at the ground under Garp's watch. Then, I raised my index finger up, before shooting it down at the rocky ground, and surprisingly, my finger managed to penetrate through the hard rocky ground without any resistance. Gart placed his eyes, full of pride, on me, who was trying out the rocky shiki techniques that I never attempted to do so until today. Attaining physical strength so high that the intensive training for each rocky shiki technique is unnecessary. I suppose that I'm too good of an instructor, or ha ha ha. Finding myself shocked once again, as I effortlessly managed to perform Geppo by the high force kicks against the air, Gut then declared, therefore, I won't be teaching you how to use them. Instead, starting from today, 
You will actively familiarize yourself with those techniques as well as begin the actual training session, Gut stated with a grin, while shaking his right hand in a relaxed manner, by sparring me on hand-to-hand -hand combat. The use of fruit won't be allowed, and there will be consequences if you fail to keep that puff contained. Got it, Gut sensei Landing back on the ground, I nodded with seriousness. It surely was an upgrade for me, finally escaping from the fate of a mere punching bag. Gut bumped his fists together, then let's get this started, brat. Alright, let's do this. And so, I was about to dash, sorrow only to see that Garp, whose sorrow was vastly faster than my sluggish one, instantly reached where I stood, with his fist cocked back. Tekai, Guom, with my now bruised arms crossed in front of my face, and me skidding back due to the force behind Garp's punch, Garp grinned at me. If you want to live on, you'll have to rely on all techniques instead of Tekai only. It seemed that he was holding back less than before now. I felt the pain in my arms, and I instinctively knew that the strength that Gut was using now was more than what I am able to handle. And where are you paying your attention to, brat? Boom. With me barely managing to dodge another punch from Gut by bending my torso unnaturally, performing Kami E, the spa more like a one-sided beatdown was currently ongoing. Swoosh. Swoosh. Garp and I rapidly blurred from location to location, engaging ourselves in high-speed combat with the uses of Sorrow and Geppo. Shigen, I jabbed my finger forward right at Garp's exposed abdomen. However, Garp's body unnaturally bent sideways due to his usage of Kami-E, dodging my technique. Immediately after, Garp swung his leg horizontally, sending out a sharp, pressurized wave of air known as Rankyaku. By using Geppo once again, I managed to evade it just in time, just to see that Gut was right in front of me, with his finger pointed at me. Waha? Shagun? Tekai? I urgently shouted while clenching my body hard, just as Gut's finger landed on my chest. Boom. From midair all the way to back to the rocky ground, I was sent blasting helplessly. However, even before I had the time to assess the damage, Gut appeared in front of me once more, with his foot about to crash onto my face. Soru. Swoosh. While in a lying position, I quickly raised my body up with my hands, before dashing to Gut's back to dodge his dangerous ranking. Yaku. Subsequently, I flipped my body up while sending forth yet another Shigen, playing Tekai. Gup stated with a grin, as he effortlessly blocked my attack with his Tekai. Yeah, well done, brat. The hand sorrow that you just performed was quite impressive, Shigen. Kami, -e, gritting my teeth, I bent my body back just to dodge Gup's Shigen, before shooting my legs up, Rankyaku. Wahaha, Rankyaku. To which Gup responded with a kick of his own. Boom. And upon collision, I found myself grimacing due to the pain from the collision. Gup's strength, even as he held back, was too much to handle. Half half having returned to being stuck on the ground, I huffed with my body already full of bruises and light injuries. However, I know him well. This spa was far from over, and will continue for hours at the very least Tekai. I clenched my muscles to my utmost capability, just when Garp appeared above me, with his fist out this time. Do you know that Tekai can also be used for the offense? Garp said with his everlasting grin, before, boom. His fist crashed onto my crossed arms. The ground below me cracked in spiderweb-like fashion due to the force behind Garp's attack, and I couldn't help but choke, having lost my breath for the moment. I can see that you've begun to get used to the Rakushikus, Garp stated casually while rolling his shoulders, but try to be more creative than that, brat. Ha! Huh. Sighing, I jumped back up from the ground, with my breathing restored. How did you move your body while using Tekai? I was aware that Jabra, one of the CP9 agents in the Anaim, was able to do this same trick as well. But I just couldn't figure out how. I mean, I scratched the back of my head as I issued my inquiry, with Gup looking at me with his arms crossed. It's like trying to bend your dick when it's hard you're going to end up tearing your muscles open. Well ha ha. Gut raised his head up and laughed out loud, before replying, Don't try to understand how it works. You have to feel it. Sorry. I didn't get it Shigen. Slash Kami E having expected Gut's sudden attack. I used all nerves I got to successfully dodge his Shigen. Immediately after, I backstepped before using Geppo to travel upward right when Gut was bending his index finger, as if about to flick, don't tell me. Gut then flicked his finger at me, Tobu flying, Shigen. Tekai. I urgently tightened my muscles, right when the sharp pressure of air collided with my body. Though the impact was lesser than the close-range Shigen, Gart's held back Tobu Shigen, managed to give me yet another bruise on my chest. He's demonstrating. Tobu Shigen one of the variants of Shigen that flicks instead of jabbing, grants increased range, but with reduced damage. Breathing heavily, I raised up my shaky right arm, before bending my finger in a similar fashion. And yet for some reason, I found myself smiling. Right now, right here, I'm becoming stronger at every second. Garn's grin widened upon sighting my action, Tobu Shigen. Swoosh. Gart tilted his head sideways to dodge the air shot that I fired, before commenting. Bohaha, well done. Hey, you know me, Garp. Huff, Sensei, taking in a deep breath while straightening my body back up. I gave a daring grin back at Garp. I'm just getting started. Well said, Smoker. Gup's eyes flashed dangerously. Then as the reward, I'll show you what's considered the secret seventh technique of Rokyashiki, that you can only learn. 
after completely mastering the other six techniques. Then, Gup brought his fists together, getting into a particular stance that I recognized right away. Rokushiki Ogi Rakuigan Garp and I both sent forth potent shock waves at one another, which collided against each other in the middle. Boom. My shock wave was immediately overwhelmed by Garp's, and I found my body blasted back from the force. But I quickly regained my bearing, and landed back on ground with a grin on my face. Hey, now that's more like it, Garp said with his arms crossed. One month. Since I've begun the intense spa with Garp, one month has already passed by. And I tell you, one month was enough for me to master the basics of all Rakushikis and Rakuigan, the pinnacle of Rakushikis. Huff huff breathing heavily, with no strength remaining in me. I fell back on the rocky ground, now lying down without any care. Rakuigan, the point of this technique is to pull up the entirety of your physical strength at the tips of your knuckles. The entirety by definition means all parts of your body, and in order for you to successfully do so, you must feel and control your body. Garp, casually walking toward me, stated, and therefore, the mastery over Rakuigan opens the next set of possibilities, known as Seimei Kaiken, Life Return. Garp leaned down and grinned in front of my face, but Seimei Kaiken isn't something that can be taught. Your brain only amounts to part of your whole body, and this technique requires every single cell within your body to know and be aware. All the other Seimei Kaiken users stated the technique only awoke during the most dangerous battles in their lives. If Haki responds to your mental strains, Seimei Kaiken responds physical-wise. Lifting me back up, Garp squinted his eyes at the sea ahead of us, trying to locate where a marine ship was. Hey now, where are they, again? However, he sighted nothing. It seemed that the ship, currently under Bogard's command, was patrolling at some distance away from this island that we stood on top of. The patrolling route changes every day, in order to prevent the pirates from shrewdly avoiding us, while still held by Garp by the back of my shirt. I said knowingly, but one thing is for sure, they are bound to come to this location as well. The patrolling route is supposed to cover the entirety of the area you are assigned to, Gup Sensei. Hum. Gup closed his eyes and hummed thoughtfully, then aha, uh -huh, placing me down on the ground. Gup said with a grin, more training, I suppose, without any word. I looked back at Gup with heavy exhaustion in my eyes, before I saw his huge fist approaching my face. Looks like I'm not too far off from learning that same ache I can boom. During the night, after we finally returned back to the ship, I was sitting outside with bandages all around my body. The exposed section of my face was brutally swollen, causing all the marine soldiers, who were on lookout duty like I currently was, to gaze at me with pity. But that wasn't the key. After I regained consciousness on this ship, the only thing I managed to see was the Gup seemed furious for some reason. He was standing on the edge of the ship, with his strong grips completely destroying the rails. Noticing my gaze, he said back then, Smoker, it seems that I will be away for a while. He seemed to be in contemplation, having just woken up back then, I couldn't follow what he was speaking of. But now, with enough time given to think, I began to put the puzzles together. Hey, Gandalf, I asked the huge, brawny man who sat on my left, is it true that Gut Sensei is going on a vacation soon? Well, while you were unconscious, after two of you returned, Vice Admiral Gut suddenly received a call from the headquarter. Gandalf replied with a serious expression on his face, I'm unsure of what the deal was about. But Vice Admiral Gut was shouting with evident anger in his tone, and from his shouts, we could tell that the person whom he was conversing with was none other than the Fleet Admiral Sengoku. Gandalf paused momentarily to breathe before continuing. Then, after the call has ended, Vice Admiral Gup suddenly declared that he will be away for quite some time, and that we will be placed under Vice Admiral Bogard's command until then. Taking out a dried fish from his left and handing it over to me to which I accepted with gratitude before taking a bite Gandalf's side, knowing that Vice Admiral Gup isn't quick to anger. Something big must have happened. Nothing comes up in my mind, however. Nodding in thanks while munching on the hard texture of the dried fish. I gazed off at the duck sea while thinking, approximately 14 months passed since my transmigration and Goldie Roger's death. What could have happened my eyes widened in realization and the dried fish fell off of my hand. Hey, smoker, are you alright? I uh, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Picking the fish back up, I smiled at Gandalf concealing my shock. The current date is December of the year 1501. The marine's utmost concern from the information that's been going back and forth was the rumor that the Pirate King has a child. However, even after checking all newborns at the estimated time of birth of Pirate King's child, Marine found no trace of Pirate King at all. Sengoku probably realized that Gup knew something about it. Then, Gup's statement of going on vacation made sense. Apart from the select few, he probably was the only one who knew the whereabouts of Porkers de Rouge. And I remember this one detail about Ace that his birthday is none other than the January 1st of the year 1502. Hey all of you the updated bounty posters arrived then. One marine soldier interrupted my thoughts all of a sudden, running into my sight with the stacks of bounty posters in his hands. Due to the harsh weather and the long distance to travel, the delivery of newspapers and bounty posters tends to be irregular. It wasn't a strange thing that we received them late at the night. However, as the marine soldier leaned down and spread out the bounty posters one by one, I found myself frozen. In the middle, there was one bounty poster with a very familiar face, the woman with long, straight, and white-colored hair. Below the picture, the name was written, Nico Olvia. Nico Olvia. 
the woman who carried on the wish of her deceased husband. Soon enough, she would be caught by the Marine, and her fellow archaeologists would be killed. By retrieving their IDs, the Marine will learn that Olvia and her friends are from Ahara, thus beginning the investigation on the island, and eventually leading to the irreversible buster call. But, does it matter to me? I mean, what can I do to prevent that from happening? Even with knowledge at my hand, standing up for the Overins will, without a doubt, serve as nothing but the struggle of a fly. Such a rash act equals throwing my life away for naught. Hawker's D-Ace, Nyko Olvia, Nyko Robin, the establishment of Freedom Army by Monkey D-Dragon, Jaguar D-Saw hiding in Elbif, Vegapink's appearance, and the restoration of survived books in the lake my head was jumbled up. There were simply too many aspects to consider. The ambiguity within the people's mind, followed by the underlying danger of acting out of impulse no matter how many times I've thought through. There was simply no way to prevent the incident. And eventually, with me unable to sleep due to these concerning thoughts, the sun has risen again. Smoker, staring off at the sea with a blank mind. I listened to Gup, whose face held a serious expression on his face. I've already told you yesterday, but I'll say it one more time. Gup's eyes narrowed as the two of us sighted another marine ship approaching us from the horizon. I'll be going away for two years, and remaining here will hinder your growth. Therefore, today, you'll be meeting your new superior. However, laying my eyes off the approaching marine ship, I gazed at Gart with an equally serious demeanor. Prior to you doing so, an important announcement must be made. Gart motioned one of the marine soldiers at the back, who, in response came up while holding the white justice. Coat something that only the marine officers are allowed to wear. Sure boy smoker, your extraordinary feats have been recognized by the headquarter. Under the approval of Fleet Admiral Sengoku, you hereby are granted the promotion to the rank of an ensign. Personally draping the justice coat around me, Gup's expression softened, congratulations, and may you advance further. I suppose that Gup purposely delayed my promotion for quite some time, in order to evade me from becoming arrogant and blindsided by my growth. After all, the number of pirates that I caught for the past year by myself alone was already reaching thousands in terms of number, and logically speaking, such a feat in the meritocratic society was bound to be rewarded. With a smile of my own, expressing my joy and gratitude, I bowed respectively at Gup, thank you Vice Admiral Gup. Holy... One of the marine soldiers, who stood at the back, muttered in disbelief, just what kind of promotion is that? All the way from chore boy to ensign how many ranks has Smoker skipped? Forget about that, another one commented with shock. I've never seen a 13-year-old boy wearing a justice coat SHH. The third marine soldier, Gandalf, slapped their backs, he's a superior now. Be respectful first and foremost. The fourth marine soldier looked at Gandalf plainly, nah. Just then, the horn blew from the approaching marine ship, which was now right in front of us. The lookout of a ship similarly blew the horn, returning their signal with our own. And here he comes, Gut commented with his arms crossed. Whether I end up getting myself involved in the Ahara incident depends on who my new superior will be I thought with my gaze headed at the ship next to us, where the marine soldiers on deck waved their hands at us, and if that person is Jaguar Diesel, I will have more option here, am I an idiot? Why am I still thinking of ways to prevent the incident when it's evident that I won't be able to do so? And just then, yo, got San, one very tall man with quite a slim build, having curly black hair flowing out of his dark blue bandana and the round sunglasses on his face, hopped out of his ship and greeted Gut brightly, it's good to see you again. And what an extremely familiar man he was. I had to suppress my urge to jump in excitement upon sighting him. Long time no see, Kuzan, Gup greeted the man with hospitality. I've been hearing a lot about you recently. Fired up as always. Huh, definitely. Kuzan pumped his fist up with liveliness. Much to my shock, his image was drastically different than that lazy man I've seen in the Anime. Oh yeah, by the way, my division was just on our way after visiting the Marineford, right? Kuzan, uncaring of the fact that Gut was barely paying any attention to him, busy picking his ear, said with excitement, apparently, Dr. Vegapink recently discovered that the Sea Stone is able to repel those Sea Kings. So I immediately pulled us there and got that new system established on my ship. You should probably do that as well, Gut San. Gut pointed at his back with a grin. Hep Bogod will do that for me. Oh, Bogod San. Long time no see. Indeed, Vice Admiral Kuzan. It's good to see you. Bogod nodded slightly while holding onto the edge of his hat returning Kuzan's greeting in a reserved manner. Kuzan chuckled while looking around Gart's ship, before fixating his eyes on me. He crouched down and placed his hand on his chin. Oh ho, and you must be that little menace I've been hearing about. You single-handedly destroyed multiple pirate crews, eh? Greetings to Vice Admiral Kuzan. I saluted at the man strictly, before replying while standing still. I believe that it was only possible for me to do so, thanks to the guidance of Vice Admiral Gup Gar. Well haha, relax, brat. Gup, who burst into laughter, slapped me on the back, causing me to fall face first. Kuzan clapped, oh, casually slapping your pupil like that. Shem HM, you're so cool as always, Gup San. Gup puffed his chest out in pride. Pointing at Kuzan, he said to me, see, Kuzan isn't the type to care about those formal stuffs. Ah. Kuzan then exclaimed in surprise, but I do, Gup San. What? Gup squinted his eyes and stared Kuzan intensely. Placing his hands on his waist, he said, last time, you told me that you don't. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Well, 
I muttered with my face still kissing the ground as two vice admirals began a childish argument among themselves. Glad to see that you're back to your usual self, Gup Sensei. I'm sure you've heard of the news. After the two of them finally calmed down, Gup said to Kuzan, I am going to be away for a while. Kuzan said solemnly, I did hear that you've been fighting with some Goku Sen over something, but the news regarding your vacation remained unknown until you told me yesterday. Honestly speaking, I would have ignored the call if it wasn't you, Garpson. Garp momentarily stood without words after Kuzan's words. Then, he asked Kuzan, Do you still believe that the world government is right, Kuzan? Kuzan's expression darkened upon hearing Garp's question. I do admit that there have been some conflicts between the higher-ups orders and my ideal. But if I were to answer your question, Gutsan, my answer would still be yes. You haven't seen the worst yet, Kuzan. Gut frowned as he recollected an event in the past. Those celestial dragons are cowering in their beds for now, thanks to the sudden surge in the number of pirates. However, it's only the matter of time before they return to their disgusting tendencies. Back then, in the place named God Valley that got destroyed during the fight against Zebek, the incidents of human trafficking and slavery mediated by celestial dragons was extremely common. Celestial dragons and world government, they are the ones committing evil just as badly as the pirates. Garp's grip on the railings tightened, and due to the authority and strength that they got, their wrongdoings are turned for greater good. How ridiculous that's what they call the justice. They're always right, and whoever opposes them is always wrong. Garp cut his words and breathed in, calming himself down. Then, he continued, Marine, from the past to the present is not but the world government's puppet. I feel can feel the shackle tightening around my arms more tightly than it ever has been. That's quite a dangerous thought, you know. Kuzan, you have no idea how much I've been thinking for the past year. Garp lowered his head in frustration in the future. There there will be numerous pirates, with the potential to become as strong as the Three Calamities, Whitebeard, Kaidu, and Big Mom. The value behind freedom has skyrocketed, and the recruitment rate of talented ones to Marine has plummeted. At this rate, Marine will simply become yet another Sifa pole, and the world will fall into chaos without a doubt. As Kuzan silently listened to Garp, Garp shifted his eyes and looked at Smoker, who was mingling among many older aged Marine soldiers, all of them seemed busy feeling the texture of the justice coat that Smoker just received. And within this dread, I found a gem. A rough, unrefined diamond it was, but with the potential to become brighter than any other star. Garp said with certainty in his tone, You seem to think very highly of him, Gupsan. Garp turned his head back in Kuzan and smiled, a month ago. I asked him once of what ideal he held, his motivation, his goal, the reason for him to become strong. I demanded those answers out of him. And guess what he said? Taking a breath, Gup continued, he defied the very concept of justice. He also defied the notion of saving the weak. Nothing can be ascertained until he personally sees and experiences. Smoker told me that he wants to become strong to live such a life the life where he can save those he wants to save, whether they are civilians, marines, celestial dragons, or pirates even. Saving pirates. Kuzan's dazed off deeply contemplating, saving criminals. If world government isn't the absolute justice, then the pirates aren't the absolute evil either. I felt enlightened from his words, and through his answer, I could understand the reason why his will didn't give up during my training. His goal required him to become the strongest in the whole world. Kuzan looked at Garp, not understanding Garp's elation, ah bohaha. My words got too lengthy, didn't they? Gup, relaxing his body and letting the grin return to his face, patted Kuzan's back, forget about it. Just make sure to treat Smoker as harshly as possible, alright? I'll leave him under your care for a while. Harshly. Kuzan, in the end, smiled while adjusting the sunglasses on his eyes. You really care about him, don't you, Gupsan? What a weird feeling that entered me as I stepped out from Gup's ship onto Kuzan's ship. With the unfamiliar justice coat on my back, I turned around to see those whom I spent the year with Gup, Bogard. Harry, Percy, Gandalf, and many more. Gazing as they grinned at me, I felt nothing but gratitude. I'm not going to say goodbye, Brat, nor any of us here. Garp, with his arms crossed, stated, because we are going to meet again in the future, right? I found a genuine smile on my face. Feeling warmth in my heart, I replied, I'll see you again in the future, Gup Sensei and all of you. Have a fun trip, Smokey. Stay safe, you got that? Kuzan, who stood next to me, commented, it seems like you've got a nice family over there. Family, huh? I chuckled as the ship I stood on top of. The marine ship under Kuzan's command began to drift away from Gup's ship, I suppose. Regardless of the upcoming conflicts for this moment now, I felt happy to exist as smoker in this world. January 1st, 1502, Marineford, Grand Line under the blue sky where the seagulls flew by. There lied one huge training ground. Many familiar faces including Hina and Bastille the known colleagues of Smoker were found drenched in sweat as they all were in push-up positions repeating the simple exercise with difficulty. Hugh. At some distance away from those trainees, there sat the purple-haired man, Zephyr. Smoking a cigarette, in his hand was a publicized report released by the higher-up, meant to be spread out among all the marines on a monthly basis. To think it's already 1502 time surely flies fast. Zephyr muttered as he read through the report, and yet, still no lead in terms of the Pirate King's legacy might as well say that he didn't have one in the first place. Then, his eyes sharply rose up from the paper, and gazed at one particular trainee who fell on the ground, Shu. 
What do you think you're doing there? Huff huff but Zephyr sensei huff, I can't huff do any longer. Shu, who was breathing so heavily that the veil in front of his face was repeatedly blown up and down, whimpered. 500, that's all I asked out of you, are you saying that such a small amount of exercise is exhausting to you? Zephyr yelled at Chu strictly, naturally, as the elite marine who's given the privileges that the normal marines are not granted with, you have the responsibility to uphold and that is to complete the training routines given by me without any complaint. Is your will so weak? that a mere pain in your muscles is enough to make you give up. Shu bit his lips in frustration. However, he simply couldn't move his arms any longer, and he felt as if his eyes were going to close at any second. Huff huff, and he wasn't the only exception. Hina and Akhan too seemed to be at their edge, with their rates of push-ups gradually becoming slower and slower. In contrast, the rest, Bastille, Maynard, Dalmatian, Cancer, and Dol, seemed to be doing fine. Zephyr, shaking his head as Shu ended up losing his consciousness, sat back down and took another puff out of his cigarette. When the boy wakes back up, he shall not be allowed to leave this ground until he gets the job done. Going back to the report in his hand, Zephyr flipped it to the next page. Oh, on that page, there was the face of one familiar white-haired boy. Chore boy smoker acknowledged for imprisoning 5,142 pirates within a year. Single-handedly Zephyr was at the loss of words. His jaw slowly opened and the cigarette fell out of his mouth but he didn't seem to have noticed. With his eyes locked onto the report, he continued reading, given a promotion to the rank of an ensign, at the age of 13. It was an achievement that was unheard of. Never in the history of Marine did a super rookie like Smoker appear even among the three most talented Marines whom Zephyr taught. Sakazuki, Kizaru, and Kuzan. Huff huff did you just say Smoker, Zephyr Sensei Dara? But still, perking up upon hearing Zephyr's words, asked curiously, what was that huff again? Smoker. Promotion, you say? Bastille's words triggered the curiosity of everyone. They excluding Shu on the ground raised their head up while still in a push-up position. You kids Zephyr shook his head while lifting his cigarette back up from the ground, before barking out. If you have the energy to talk, focus on your exercises 49 in terms of number. Among them, the individual wearing the black fedora hat, fitting black suit, and rapier sheathed on his waist Hustleberry the Meister has been identified. There is no other possible explanation, we finally caught up on them, Vice Admiral Kuzan. On the deck of a huge marine ship that was steadily approaching one island where various man-made buildings were peeking through. One tall marine with a justice coat at its full glory on his back, Vice Admiral Kuzan, spoke into the Den Den Mushi on his palm. At last Kuzan formed a smile on his face. Kuzan listened as the voice emitted from the Den Den Mushi suddenly changed. What? One marine officer who stood right behind Kuzan, Rear Admiral Stainless, said with an annoyed frown, Ensign, do you know who we are facing right now? Leaning into the Den Den Mushi that Kuzan was holding, Stainless barked into it. He's Hustleberry the Meister, he's one of the seven known super rookies of the current generation, and his bounty amounts to a sheer 150 million Beely. Back off, you already served your role however. Before Stainless could finish his words, his face was pushed away by Kuzan. Chill, Stainless. Oh, and please don't come too close to me. My type is a lady with a hot body, not a man. Kuzan said in a serious manner, causing Stainless to sweat drop. But Vice Admiral Kuzan, he's, go ahead, smoker. You got my permission. But let's make one thing clear, Kuzan said firmly, as his eyes gazed off at the nearing island. You better have subdued all 49 of them by the time I arrive. Vice Admiral. Yes, sir. I answered with a grin on my face before giving the mini Den Den Mushi back to my colleague, who was fuming as she snatched the creature away from my hand. Swoosh. Then, I sidestepped to dodge a fist from her, I really don't know why the girls I get to know all have the tendency to get violent. Smoker said person, Joan, fumed, our order was to await for the main division to arrive. What are you thinking Arg? and why did Vice Admiral Kuzan even approve that? Joan, the 19-year-old Ensign. Apparently, she was in a similar case as me having temporarily been transferred to Kuzan's unit from Vice Admiral Tsuru's division. And I admit that at first, I didn't recognize her at all. It was only after learning her name that I realized that she has actually come out in the Anime before. Cracking my knuckles and stretching my legs, I began to prepare myself for the battle. Not bothering to look back at Joan, I answered seriously, you read the past reports too, right? Meister has a peculiar taste, one that can't be tolerated. The longer we wait, the more we place these citizens at risk. But besides interrupting Joan's words with my own, I stated, the high bounty of Hustleberry originated from his malicious deeds rather than his strength. You are underestimating our capabilities, Joan. Joan raised her eyebrow, our grinning. I, within an instant, grabbed Joan by morphing my right arm into smoke and jumped off of the rooftop where we were hiding on top of, Smoker causing her to scream as we were falling down. Tap. And now, the two of us landed right at the central plaza, right in front of Hustleberry. Sitting with his legs crossed and smoking an exquisite looking cigar, he raised his head slightly to reveal his sharp eyes. Our appearance instantly earned the attention of his crew. Damn it, Joan bickered while locking her eyes at our enemies in front. I'll see you after this is taken care of. Sure, sure, I chuckled in amusement, but quickly wiped the smile off my face. Seeing that we were quite the young-aged individuals, the pirates crackled. Marines, I see, throwing the cigar away, Hustleberry stood up and placed his hands in his pockets. 
But those justice coats, huh? Just how lowly has Marine's standard fallen? His subordinates began to raise their weapons one by one, ready to engage at any moment. Hustleberry adjusted his fedora hat while giggling darkly, regardless. I must thank your stupidity. Behehe, <laughs> this is going to be entertaining bomb. All of a sudden, one pirate standing next to Hustleberry was blown away. By whom? None other than me who instantly moved a substantial amount of distance, by the use of Soru. The smile was immediately erased from Hustleberry. Developing the dangerous light in his eyes, he unsheathed the rapier. Swoosh! He stabbed his rapier forth at rapid speed. But I effortlessly dodged it by tilting my head. Shigen. Clang. While Hustleberry's rapier was outstretched, I jabbed my finger. However, Hustleberry moved his rapier at a quick speed, such that my finger was clashing against the blade. I suppose that I was wrong, Hustleberry growled, a noteworthy one that you are. Clang clang clang. Immediately after Hustleberry's statement, my legs moved at an incredible speed, sending forth sharp waves of pressurized air, which Hustleberry parried by slashing his rapier. He then dashed at me, all while, shoot him, the seven pirates surrounding me shot their guns at me. Tekai, gum dome. Suddenly, Joan appeared in front of me and spat multiple rounds of gum shots all around us, and before such gum shots had the chance to travel out, they stuck onto one another, generating the thick layer of gum dome. That surrounded the two of us. The bullets shot by the pirates didn't manage to penetrate the rubbery wall and were bounced back at those pirates. Then, grabbing Joan by the shoulder and pushing her behind me, I dashed forward and clapped my palm around the sharp rapier that pierced through the layer of gum. Devil fruit user. I see, Hustleberry commented as his eyes narrowed at Joan, but quite underwhelming in comparison to mine. Then, before my eyes, his form morphed. A tail was grown. He grew notably taller and broader, all while maintaining an overall slim figure. Along with the patterns across his skin, no. Fur, in front of me stood the human cheetah hybrid. Clang. Just before Hustleberry could stab through the vulnerable Joan, I punched it away with my fist. You. Hustleberry, who was sent few steps back due to my punch at his rapier, widened his eyes in shock, you can keep up with my speed. I cracked my neck casually, speed, what speed? You're glaringly slow. Joan, who seemed annoyed by the fact that her gum defense was easily broken, began to chew her mouth as if chewing gum there probably is one though. Go on. And as I dashed at the speed faster than what Hustleberry was capable of, rendering the latter shocked, and broke his rapier with my fist, gum shot Joan spat out the huge, rapid traveling gum, pink in color. That slapped onto the five subordinates of Hustleberry in total, immobilizing them. Meanwhile, I was now right underneath the huge form of Hustleberry, with my index finger stabbed into the latter's chest, Shigen. Implosion. From my dug-in finger, a huge volume of smoke suddenly burst out from it, smashing and rupturing the internal organs of Hustleberry. Cough evading the blood that Hustleberry vomited from the impact, I swiftly pulled my bloody finger out. As Hustleberry has now lost the balance, and was falling to the ground, I clenched my right hand tight, boom, before smashing it right onto the exposed face of Hustleberry which was effective enough to send Latter into the realm of unconsciousness. Captain following were the anguished cries of Hustleberry's subordinates, who rushed in on me simultaneously, filled with nothing but rage. Bang bang bang. Bullets were shot from all directions. Swoosh. The swords, spears, axes, and whatever weapons I sighted, were all hacked and slashed at me, generating a chaotic view that would have terrified a normal person. Kami E and in midst of this chaos, I've begun to dance. Swoosh. Two swords slashed above my head while an axe attempted to cut my legs apart. I slid down all the way to the ground, evading all the blades, before bouncing my body back up and letting the bullets slip underneath me. Then, I grabbed a long spear by its wooden body, before breaking it in half and flicking the shards into the eyes of the approaching pirate, causing him to lose his grip on his gun and scream in pain. Shigen, plucking a hole into the chest of one nearby pirate, I lowered my body and swiped my leg across the ground, causing multiple pirates around me to lose their balance. Shigen, Shigen, Shigen. It was a one-sided massacre. Casually appearing in each pirate by the proficient use of Soru, I landed a Shigen, one by one, before any of them had time to react. Tobu Shigen. Before one farthest pirate could shoot at me, I flicked my finger, causing that pirate's body to be knocked back from the impact, before, gunshot. Being enveloped by another gun bullet that Joan fired off of her mouth. Tap. And when I stood in the middle again, there was no longer a standing pirate around the plaza. See, it wasn't much of a trouble. Turning to Joan, I grinned confidently, bounties aren't as accurate as you think you know. By the way, leaning down on the unconscious and heavily injured Hustleberry, I asked Joan without looking at her, what happened to your sword? I've been with Joan for a month. And if there is one thing that I can tell you for sure, it was the fact that she despised the idea of eating a devil fruit. I mean, she claims herself as a gourmet. With her body now relaxed, Joan pointed her finger sideways while sighting. Following her finger, I saw a sword that was broken in half. It seemed that right when the battle began, Joan's sword broke upon her first swing. Yet again. At this point, you may as well use something else like a club. I suggested truthfully, just how many swords have you broken so far? Forget fighting an enemy any katana of average grade will simply break after you swing it once against the empty air. For the past month, I've seen Joan breaking the countless swords being unable to hold her strength back. 
A simple problem it was, but for some reason, she wasn't able to fix it even now. Mind your business, smoker, Joan said with a frown. It isn't my fault those swords were simply too weak for me. Probably due to her mentality. By the way, what was with those guns you shot? I asked with curiosity. I mean, I don't recall you ever eating a devil fruit. Shion, in response, opened her mouth and peeled out a flat device. It's some sort of gum-like substance dispenser. Using the body heat as the energy to operate, this device somehow converts a person's saliva into a sticky gum-like substance from what I heard. Shion said while inspecting the said device. This is given by Vice Admiral Kuzan and he told me that he received it from Dr. Vegapink during his latest visit. She seemed to have completely forgotten all the anger from me pulling her into the battle just previously. According to Vice Admiral Kuzan, the archaeologists of Ahara initially found and brought this to Dr. Vegapink, who managed to restore it. Their analysis concluded that this is a weapon that was used by the people from the past fascinating, isn't it? It actually is. Agreeing to her words, I then asked, but why would Vice Admiral Kuzan give it to you? We made a trade, Jones' expression darkened, in return for me being forbidden from the armory. He handed me this. You can't really blame me for that, you know. Then, the third voice entered my ears. Shion and I turned our heads to the direction where the voice came from, and was met with the sight of Kuzan, who had Stainless and many other marine soldiers running from behind. Vice Admiral Kuzan, Joan immediately lowered her head in a respectful manner. At this point, I think the only way for you to yield a sword is to find a sword that can handle your strength, or learn haki. I swear, I think that's the reason why Tsurusen sent you to me. Kuzan said in a friendly manner, before turning his attention at the fallen pirates around us. Nonetheless, well done, you two. On the other hand, Stainless was seen to be giving orders to the marine soldiers. Make sure that every single of one of these scums are identified. Yes, sir. Subsequently, Stainless turned at me with a stoic expression and reluctantly spoke. I suppose that I was wrong. Nice work, Ensign. I bowed with respect. Thank you, Rear Admiral Stainless. Kuzan, who was now standing next to me, crouched down and stared at the unconscious Hustleberry. I admit that you were quite a clever fellow, Meister, using your own subordinates as baits to lose a chase. However, that along with your baseless hubris, was the reason why you were left with only 49 in number, ultimately leading to such an anticlimactic ending to your piracy. Then, one marine soldier, who was holding onto the Den Den Mushu, suddenly came in running, said Den Den Mushu was crying, which indicated that someone from the other side was calling. All marines temporarily stopped whatever they were doing. Some of them groaned, knowing what was about to come. Kuzan reached his hand out to the dial of the Den Den Mushi, and lifted it up, Moshi Moshi. Yes indeed, and you called at the perfect time. Kuzan stated with his eyes on Hustleberry. Hustleberry the Meister has just been captured with all his remaining crew members. I request that the ships are sent here at Doomcount Island as soon as possible. Kuzan raised an eyebrow, but replied nonetheless, Go ahead, Goldtooth Vane. I have seen the bounty poster of this man before, he was an infamous pirate with the bounty of 1,174,500,000 Beely on his head. But question is, why would they travel all the way back to G2? Kuzan stayed still, with his face shadowed by his hair. Then, he raised his head back up, expressing the serious gleam in his eyes, will do. With such, the Den Den Mushi closed its eyes. All the marines fell to silence. The Goldtooth Pirates, where the captain alone had a bounty of over a billion though Kuzan, already was an individual who's experienced the new world. It wasn't the case for the rest of us. Hey, Kuzan San, and in this tense atmosphere, I spoke up jokingly. If we win, are you finally getting your own code name? Kuzan shrugged, I doubt it. Many old timers don't want a youngster like me to stand above them, after all. That's unfair, Joan commented with her arms crossed. Your feats up to now should be more than enough to become an admiral candidate. It's fine, rank doesn't matter to me anyway. Chuckling lightly from Joan's words, Kuzan turned back. His justice coat fluttered magnificently as he walked with his hands in his pockets and his head fixated forward. He then commanded seriously, the subdivision under Commodore Monarch will remain here and await the backup from the Marineford. Make sure that Meister is immobilized with the Sea Stone. Yes, sir. I stood back up and slicked my hair back with my hands. The rest of you, brace yourself cause we're heading out right now. Yes, sir. This was a task of an entirely different magnitude when compared with the case of Hustleberry. Those whom we were about to face now weren't mere rookies but notorious chunks of the sea. The pirates with the proficiency over Haki. In this state, I found my heart thumping fast. Is it that I'm nervous, or that I'm excited? I wasn't sure, but one thing was sure, as I began to move as well. Following Kuzan from the back I was grinning for reasons unknown w wait, please wait for me, from my back Joan suddenly talked. Turning back, I saw her uh, carrying the pile of swords with her arms. She then looked at me desperately, causing me to sigh. Marine base G2 under the mighty, metal wall base that serves as the embodiment of justice. The blood dripped. Plop. It was a sunny day. Yet, the view underneath was gruesome, filled with the corpses of marine soldiers and the heavy metallic scent. How ridiculous it was for marines to be defeated at their own base. This talked a lot about the strength of this tall, black head man. Goldtooth Vane. I still remember the humiliation you've given me on that day. The utter defeat that resulted in me sacrificing my past crewmates just to survive. Vane growled as he gazed into a corpse of a marine officer, up until today. 
I patiently waited and waited for more. Oh, how sweet it is to finally achieve my vengeance. He then grinned as he leaned into the face of the corpse, revealing a golden canine tooth that was distinguishable from the rest of his teeth. Isn't that right, Vice Admiral Victorious Captain? Then, another man characterized by an eye patch on his right eye and a sword sheathed on his waist entered the scene. He was the vice captain of the crew, who went by the name Bruiser. What? Vane frowned in annoyance. Didn't I tell you not to interrupt my happy time before? However, disregarding Vane's complaint, Bruiser stated stoically, the marines have entered a site. Yo, capped. Then, another voice was heard from above. Raising his head up, Vane came to see the view of a goofy-looking teen, who dangled around a slim metal pole. That usually served as a tool for the marines to quickly descend a floor. Said teen had wild, unkempt, blue-colored hair. His similarly blue-colored eyes sparkled vibrantly, reflecting his eccentric demeanor. Upon a glance, one may get a feeling that something was off about this teen. Do I get to kill all of them by myself, just like how you allowed me here? The teen laughed crazily all of a sudden, lahaha I mean, these ones here were far too weak to give me an actual entertainment, you know. Shut up and get down here Avery. Vane angrily shouted at the teen, causing him to shrug, before jumping down from high up without any hesitation. Tap. Lightly landing right in front of Vane, the teen and Avery suddenly stood strictly and grinned with his eyes wide open. I like Captain Avery at your service. Go on. Without bothering to suppress the anger that stemmed simply from watching the teen's antics, Vane smashed his fist into Avery, sending the latter to crash into the metal wall at the back. I must admit that he certainly is different from the rest. Looking at the site where the dust arose from his lone eye, Bruiser asked, where did you even manage to find a monster like him, Captain? ECH, he may be annoying as hell, but Vane spat on the floor as he snarled. He's at least useful when it comes to fighting. Turning around, Vane walked out of the room full of corpses to the outside of the base. Bruiser followed him from the left, and a very jovially caught up to Vane's right. Upon the three of them exiting, Hey, uh, Captain, that marine ship is awfully close to us. Ha ha ha, let's shoot it down, just like any other. They were granted the sight of their crew members, who were drinking and laughing out loud on the beach, all while having their weapons out, ready to engage at any moment. Shifting his gaze onto the approaching marine ship, Bane's eyes met the eyes of the commander of the marine ship, Kuzan. Vice Admiral Kuzan and I will handle Gold Tooth and Bruiser, Stainless, who stood in front of Jion and me, stated firmly, Stay out of our ways if you don't want to get hurt. Jion, who had a stockpile of swords on her left, nodded strictly, Yes sir. Of course, Rear Admiral Stainless, I replied, with my eyes focused on the blue-haired teen, he seemed to be of a similar age as me. By the way, do we have information on that one? Noticing my gaze on him, the blue-haired teen suddenly turned his face to look at me and made a crazed smile. Then he raised his hand up and waved at me as if looking at an old friend. No, that teen is an enigma, Stainless replied with his eyes still on the pirates. There isn't even a single file of information about him. I assume that he's something akin to Goldtooth's apprentice. Then, briefly shifting his eyes at Jion and her pile of swords, Stainless sighed and shook his head. Jion, who was still looking forward, acted as if she didn't notice his gaze. Another marine officer named Happy, whose rank was captain, now shouted out, ready. Many marine soldiers simultaneously loaded their rifles, which were pointed at the pirates. Some others placed the cannonballs and cannons, ready to be fired at any moment. Ah, now I see who you are, the supposed captain of the pirates. Vane grinned as he walked casually, revealing his golden tooth, Vice Admiral Kuzan. I've been hearing a lot about you recently. Aren't you quite a busy one? Not really, Kuzan replied coolly. I'm simply catching a few sardines here and there, that's all. Vane shook his right hand casually, before clenching it into a fist. Then why don't you test out and see whether I'm a sardine or not? Will do. At the next moment Kuzan stretched his hand out just as Vane jumped up from the sand, ice block, pheasant beak. The huge, majestic pheasant of ice instantly blasted out of Kuzan toward the rapidly approaching Vane. Vane grinned before punching forth to the ice pheasant. Boom. Then, with the ice pheasant shattered, fire slashing gauge. Rear Admiral Stainless and Vice Captain Bruiser commanded at the same time, beginning the battle at Marine Base G2. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.